You're looking live at the Crew Dragon spacecraft on top of a Falcon 9 rocket set to launch three astronauts and one cosmonaut to the International Space Station in a little more than three hours. It's a beautiful sight outside, beautiful weather here at the Kennedy Space Center, where we welcome you for our live coverage of NASA and SpaceX's launch of Crew 5. I'm Daryl Nail, and with me is NASA astronaut Bob Binken, who along with Doug Hurley were the first astronauts to fly Crew Dragon into space. Bob, it's great to have you here. You were part of that historic flight. And now here you are back helping us with our launch commentary for today's mission. Well, thank you, Daryl. I'm super excited to be here. A beautiful day to relive my launch experience. Looking forward to it. You certainly will remember this experience well. We've got video recorded from just a less than an hour ago of Crew 5 getting suited up in that historic suit-up room. And there you see them. Everything went smoothly. You can see the astronauts there uh, in their spacesuits after getting them fitted and Core tested. Countdown. And those minus three hours and 23 minutes. The displays are configured for crew ingress on schedule. That's our launch audio. We're going to pause whenever that comes up. But tell me a little bit about those custom flight suits, Bob. Well, Daryl, I've heard those suits referred to as space tuxedos by some of the SpaceX team. And uh, they are custom fit, and they, they are you know what the crew needs to wear in case there was any sort of an issue inside of the capsule. They, uh, they're custom fit, and they'll be ready to wear them when they head into space. Not designed to go outside the capsule, but certainly if something were to happen inside the capsule, they pressurize, and that keeps them safe. Now, we want to invite you folks who are watching to participate in our broadcast today. If you would like to ask Bob a question uh, over the next three hours, you can jump on any number of our social media uh, handles. Uh, one of the ones that we're looking at is the hashtag AskNASA handle on Twitter. Send us that tweet. Uh, with a question and the hashtag AskNASA, and we will get to it. Now, in addition to Bob's analysis, we have teams across the country covering the action, and there they are. We'll get updates from SpaceX headquarters, giving us a wave from out there in Hawthorne, California, and Houston, Texas, uh, Mission Control Center. Hello to you as well. And, of course, right here in Florida, uh, we've got our interviewees standing by. Now let's check in with our team monitoring preparations for launch at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Take it away, ladies. Hi, I'm NASA's Sandra Jones with NASA Communications. And I'm Jesse Anderson, a production engineering manager here at SpaceX. As we count down to liftoff, welcome to Mission Control. This is where our teams are staffed around the clock to monitor Dragon and the mission. On console or headset in Mission Control yep. are six key positions. The mission director is the in left, charge yeah. of the room <laughs> and tasked Thank with you. making real-time decisions to ensure mission success. The person that you'll hear talking to the astronauts is the crew operations and resources engineer, who you'll hear us refer to as the core throughout the broadcast cast and there you can see them on the screen. The additional positions are focused on vehicle systems including avionics, navigation and control, software, propulsion, life support and communication with ground support teams. And NASA has its own team members in Mission Control Houston where they've been preparing the space station for Dragon's arrival. We'll meet several of the key players later when we check in with them. And upon liftoff, today's ride to the International Space Station will take about 29 hours, with Dragon flying autonomously the entire way. And just like autopilot on a commercial aircraft, the crew always has the option or the ability to take manual control of the spacecraft if needed. So let's head back over to Florida as we await the crew's departure for the launch pad. Daryl? Sandra and Jesse, thank you very much. And here they come, Fancy Crew 5. Crew are are, they're ready for crew arrival, and crew are walking out of the ONC room now, on schedule. Indeed they are, and there they are. The astronauts of Crew 5 taking their first steps outside as they head to the pad. 
from left to right. Cosmonaut Anna Kikina, Josh Cassida, Commander Nicole Mann, and Koichi Wakata. That was a pose for a picture. And here they go to their ride out to the pad. Three Teslas all lined up in queue, along with a full security escort. And the folks you see there, family, loved ones, this is a moment to have an exchange, Bob. It is. It's an opportunity for the crew, if you will, to take a little bit of a break from the technical briefs that they've been having this morning as they got suited up and understood what the weather conditions were. They get a chance to say goodbye to their families, uh, see some smiling faces. Again, have a little bit of a relaxing moment with their families before they get serious again and head out to the launch pad. And they keep a certain distance away. You can see the stanchions. You can see the family that are gathered there. And, of course, that's in the interest of the astronauts' health. That's absolutely true, Daryl. You know, the crew has been in a quarantine state for uh, the last several days. You know, they don't want to bring anything to space station that uh, we don't have, you know, really tight control of. And so they'll stay back from folks, but uh, they'll give some air hugs and some waves. All right, let's listen in. can't make out exactly what's being said, but we know from your experience, Bob, that it, it can be an emotional moment. Uh, absolutely. You know, for the Demo 2 mission, my son was super excited to yell, Launch America. So that was the one thing that you could absolutely hear. Even inside the, the suit with our deep insert earplugs, you could hear that Launch America tune when he uh, sang it out. <laughs> your wife said the same thing, that uh, you could hear him shouting out and and that's something actually particular to astronauts with young family members, with young children, that you have to prepare them for. I was watching a documentary. Um, your son wasn't exactly on board at the beginning. Uh, absolutely. At the beginning of the idea of, of a parent launching into space was something he was uh, unfamiliar with, a little bit scared of. Uh, but we brought him down here to Kennedy, got him a chance to see a cargo launch into space. And then uh, by the end of that experience, he was ready for me to go first, mommy to go second. And he said he was going third. So we're, uh, we'll <laughs> wait to see if that happens. And then we'll have him on for the Crew 37 show. Yeah, well, he thinks probably Crew 16. So Crew 16, okay, a bit earlier. Schedule, yeah. I like him. He's uh, ambitious. Look at that license plate. I was just noticing that blast off. Yeah, Darrell, the, the SpaceX team has been creative with those license plates. It's always cool to see what they add to the Teslas to make the experience just a little bit personalized. It's a nice touch. As you can see, the media in the background positioning themselves for a good shot as the Teslas roll out with a full security escort on a 20-minute drive to pad 39A. And they're queuing up a playlist right now, Bob, uh, with some tunes. In fact, I've got the playlist to one of the vehicles. I believe it's the lead astronaut vehicle, which would be the second one in this line. Here's what they're going to be listening to. Oh Yeah by Yellow. <laughs> Danger Zone by Kenny Loggins. Stronger by The Score. Slow Ride. Fog Hat. Everybody Got There Something by Nikki Costa. Sabotage by The Beastie Boys. Mainstream Kid by Brandy Carlisle and Don't Stop Believing by Journey. It's a nice list right there. It's a wonderful mix. There's a little bit of a slow and react, relaxing portion of it, as well as something with a, a little bit of emotion as they head out to the launch pad. You know, when Doug and I headed out to the launch pad, we had some uh, tunes as well, and uh, we took the experience to capture kind of the same things, the excitements of uh, launching into space. Back in Black was one of the songs we selected from ACDC since we were both headed back into, into space again, and uh, it, was, it was an exciting time for us. 
And that was followed, I believe, by a girl from Ipanema, which <laughs> it, was a very much a contrast. In <laughs> it, it was, Daryl. You know, this is a 20-minute ride out to the launch pad. The crew's been on a very tight schedule as they uh, work their way to get to this point. But now's the time to sit back and uh, wind your watch and, and wait for the actual launch event. So that, that waiting music came from the Blues Brothers movie, and, and Doug and I knew there was just going to be a time where we had to wait our turn to launch on that rocket. Windows are open now in the Teslas and family members just now retreating back from the vehicles, but then also getting another moment up there next to the car, which is just completed. And there they go. Four on countdown. T minus three hours and 15 minutes. Crew are beginning their transport from the ONC room to the pad right on schedule. There's the call out from the SpaceX team. The crew now departing the Neil Armstrong operations and checkout building. Slow rolling. As they make a shot available for all of the media and photographers down there. They're beginning their 20 minute drive with a full security escort across NASA's Kennedy Space Center and out to launch pad 39A. The track they're taking goes through the industrial area and then gets out to the NASA Causeway and the Kennedy Causeway. And Bob, as we were watching that moment there, I want to play a piece of tape that we have from uh, your wife, Megan, talking about those moments leading up to launch. And we're also going to see footage of uh, that historic mission that you participated in, Demo 2. We'll also see hers, and we'll get to see the goodbyes from either one. Let's take a look at that now. We want to give you a little flashback. Take a look at the screen <laughs> now. You might remember this. Demo 2, <laughs> oh, and there you are in the light blue yep. with your son saying goodbye to your husband, Bob Bacon, on that historic flight. That's right. That was a really special moment, and uh, it was great to see how excited my son was to see his father. There were no tears. It was all smiles and cheering. Uh, my son, I think, was determined to say, launch America first and loudest. And so that's uh, that's what he was doing. He did a great job. And then in April, Crew 2, this was your launch. And yes. now the role was reversed. You were in the astronaut suit getting ready to go out and launch. And your husband was there with your son. That's right. And I was listening out for that for that launch America. And I, <laughs> sure enough, I could hear it from probably 20 feet away. Um, that was a wonderful moment. Wife, Megan MacArthur, who flew on Crew 2 to the International Space Station following up your certification mission. Yeah, it was a, a moment that we wanted our son to have a positive experience with, and he certainly did. Again, smiles and hugs and cheering. And while we didn't hear the voices of the crew's uh, families and guests as they walked out, uh, we did definitely hear that cheering when they got their chance to drive away. And we continue to follow the convoy from high above our flight operations team. The helicopter crew getting a good shot there as they go. Now let's uh, check in with Hawthorne and get our first update from SpaceX's Kate Tice, who, by the way, was at this very desk, Bob, when you launched. Good to have you back, Kate. Thanks, Daryl. I'm Kate Tice, and I'm the Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX, and I'm going to be bringing you live status updates from the launch teams uh, this morning. Now, for those following along with our launch preparations over the last week, you'll know that we had a successful dress rehearsal a couple days ago um, that of our launch operations on October 2nd, followed by a successful static fire of our nine Merlin 1D engines. Now, fast forward a bit to this morning, and we're coming up on, there it is, the T-3 hour and 12 minute mark uh, and so far all is going well for launch. Uh, earlier in the night the team began clearing the hazard area and buildings around pad 39A known as the blast danger area or BDA as you might hear it called out today. At T minus four hours, there was a briefing by the SpaceX launch director, and good news, there is nothing significant to report on the rocket. At this time, the advanced team was also cleared to enter the pad and start prepping the uh, vehicle for the crew's arrival, which we're tracking there on screen, and we're expecting them to arrive at about T minus two hours and 55 minutes, uh, so just uh, shortly coming up. So uh, the only people remaining on the pad at this point in time are those needed for ingress of the astronauts. At the launch pad, Falcon 9 is powered on and we're currently monitoring telemetry and pressurizing gas, gas storage vessels. Engine and stage checkouts were performed several hours ago. 
On top of Falcon 9, of course, we have the Dragon spacecraft, and it is ready for the crew. Functional checkouts were performed, and most recently, the Dragon propellant system was pressurized to final flight pressure, and the side hatch has been opened by the advanced team. So at this point in time, I can report that all spacecraft systems are go. And as for the range, uh, launch range is ready to support and working no issues at this time. And uh, as you have probably been following along, we have been uh, tracking the weather conditions carefully over the last week as we dealt with the remnants of Hurricane Ian. Uh, as you can see on your screen, it's a gorgeous morning uh, out there at Kennedy Space Center. The weather, it, the weather is cooperating as we count down to liftoff. Uh, we have been tracking uh, down range winds uh, that had been no-go overnight, but as of the T-minus six-hour weather brief this morning, uh, it cleared and we were green there. So everything is looking good for weather at this point, but we will continue to monitor. Now, with all that being said, let's head back over to Daryl and Bob uh, for another check-in from Kennedy. All right, thank you, Kate. And yes, the weather here at Kennedy is nearly perfect for launch. Let's introduce you now to today's crew. We begin with Nicole Mann. The California native holds a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering and is a Colonel in the Marine Corps. Nicole was selected by NASA in June 2013. And today, the Crew-5 Commander will be flying into space for the first time. And once she reaches the space station, she'll be the first Native, wo Native American woman to stay on station. Sitting next to Nicole is Josh Cassida. He grew up in Bear Lake, Minnesota. The physicist and U.S. Navy test pilot flew 23 combat missions. He later became an instructor at the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School, and more recently, he served as the capsule communicator in mission control. But today, he's the pilot aboard Dragon. In the role of mission specialist is veteran Japanese astronaut Koichi Wakata. Altogether, Koichi flew four space shuttle missions, a Roscosmos Soyuz, and was on a long-duration stay aboard the International Space Station. Altogether, Koichi has spent 11 months in space, the veteran. And the, and the fourth member, the second mission specialist, is Roscosmos cosmonaut Anna Kikina. She graduated from the Nova Sibirsk State Academy of Water Transport in 2006. In 2012, Anna officially became a candidate for the position of test cosmonaut. Crew 5 will be Anna's first flight into space as part of the recent resumption of integrated crews on U.S. crew spacecraft and the Soyuz with the Russian state space corporation Roscosmos. As part of integrated crew a week and a half ago, NASA astronaut Frank Rubio flew to the ISS aboard a Soyuz. Flying integrated crews ensures operational safety. Crew members on station are trained to do maintenance and spacewalks. It also protects against contingencies such as problems that could arise on, on the station, serious medical issues, or an emergency aboard the station that requires a crew and vehicle um, that they are assigned to return to Earth sooner than planned. All right, the crew taking a turn onto the Saturn Causeway, and this is the road that leads to the Vehicle Assembly Building. Which is notable, Bob, because the astronauts right now taking a similar path to Hurricane Ian as it crossed the state and came over our area. That's the operations and support building behind it. But then behind that, going through here, is the vehicle assembly building. And after studying, studying the data, we learned the storm took uh, that similar path. And as we widen out the view here, you can see, there it is, the Artemis logo, and a great shot of that vehicle assembly building with the crew going by. Now, the Crew-5 launch was delayed several days due to Hurricane Ian taking aim at Florida. And after studying the data, here's the path that we found it took. Take a look at this graphic put together by meteorologists with satellite data. It shows the track through the state. You can see the center of circulation, of course, the devastating impacts to the Fort Myers Beach area. More than 100 people killed and complete devastation. By the time across our area right there, you can see it came out the other side on Florida. Between pad 39A and 39B, and 39B is where we had our moon rocket, the SLS and Orion spacecraft. But officials here at NASA and the launch team with SLS made the decision to move the SLS indoors. And this is video from that day, three days prior. 
the mighty SLS and Orion spacecraft going into the shelter of the vehicle assembly building as Hurricane Ian passed overhead. It's a four mile, 10 hour trek it was that day. And we got winds, Bob, over 96 knots at the top of one of the lightning towers out at pad 39B. So certainly the winds were whipping up high and down below around 60 knots. It was a good move to put that rocket in the shelter. Yes, it's just remarkable to kind of have seen the pack track of the storm, have it come right through the Kennedy Space Center, and to be sitting here just a couple of days later getting ready to launch a crew into space. So now we await a new launch date for Artemis, which we know is going to be targeted in the mid-November area. And the astronauts just passing the vehicle assembly building. Crew 4, when they were here, the rocket was out on the pad, and they got to actually go out and get a tour. This team getting to drive by that rocket, and certainly astronauts must be thinking about that mission, right? Artemis 1, 2, and 3 going on a test flight out to the moon, and then ultimately landing back on the moon to establish more of a permanent presence there. Absolutely, Daryl. It's a super exciting time from an astronaut perspective. As you know, we still have missions headed to the International Space Station, taking crews up both on the Soyuz rocket and on the, the Falcon 9 and the Dragon at this time. We look forward to seeing the Starliner uh, vehicle make its arrival on board the International Space Station as well. But Orion, with the Artemis missions that are upcoming, is just an exciting time. Returning to the moon is something that we all dream about. And there they are making the right-hand turn to go towards pad 39A, where SpaceX's facilities are, as well as the launch tower and the rocket that awaits them, a brand new booster, and the good ship Endurance, as you would say, Bob. On yes. its second flight. <laughs> On its second flight. You know, this is the time for that uh, that slow ride song probably to <laughs> kind of play back for the crew. You know, Doug and I had our, our waiting room music, our elevator music to kind of pass the time. Uh, the, the crew's, of course, excited for the mission in front of them, but they've got to wait for the actual time to launch into space. And this is a great shot, uh, point of view camera from the lead Tesla looking at the security vehicle in the front. You can see there the launch pad to the left as that rocket gets closer and closer. And I wonder, Bob, at, at what point do you, do you start to feel some nerves kick in? Because there's this excitement, as you've described. But then also, especially for your flight, being the first one, there must have been some nerves. You know, there's definitely some nervousness associated with launching into space. Uh, the crew gets a lot of training, and, and, and it, from an experience perspective, they try to check off as many blocks as they can so that uh, that nervousness is something at least that they're familiar with. And so for Doug and I, you know, we had made this ride before as uh, shuttle crew members. Uh, we climbed up to the launch pad as shuttle crew members. That wasn't new. It was really the fueling operation for us where we really felt like we were doing something new and that nervousness started to kick in. Interesting because yes, that's uh, an operation unique to SpaceX. Yes, the fueling of the rocket with the crew on board is something that uh, was new with the Falcon 9 rocket. And it's uh, new from a crew, from an astronaut perspective, from our experience base, but uh, they've managed to accomplish it uh, super successfully. There you see the security vehicle pauses, comes off to the side, and the Tesla vehicles roll on along with the MRAP in tow. And this begins the part of a really neat experience, going up the slow grade as they pass the security checkpoint and into the blast danger area. This is the area only for the astronauts and the advanced team, as well as the closeout crew. It's a restricted area. And you go up that slow hill and you're looking right at that rocket. You know, Daryl, as you make your way to the launch pad, you kind of go through layers, if you will, of, of people that can be near you. So whether that's your family and your guests when you're back at the ONC building, uh, but as you make your way to the pad surface, there are these milestones that you get past where you become more and more alone on your ride into orbit. And so heading up this hill uh, to the launch pad surface, it's definitely a smaller group, and that group continues to shrink all the way to hatch closure. And in your case, until it was just you and Doug Hurley.
That's true. It was just uh, Doug and I and, uh, of course, uh, all the support team that's uh, reaching out to you via the radio to make sure that the, they're watching over and making sure that you're ready to head off into space. But it was definitely Doug and I alone with our thoughts. These four Crew-5 astronauts now actually on the pad surface. As you can see them driving onto it, there's a track that they just came over that goes around the launch pad. That's a, a relic from the space shuttle era, as well as the Apollo. There's the base of the rocket, and dead ahead, the elevators to the launch tower that will take them up to the top of the crew access arm and allow them to make entryway into the Crew Dragon. And at T-minus 2 hours and 55 minutes, we'll get that announcement that the crew has arrived, so, so they're a little early. It's always best to be a little bit early if you can for each of these major events, of course. And so for them to arrive uh, when they're supposed to be there is Core what's on critical. Countdown. At T-minus 3 hours, the crew have arrived at the pad on schedule. And so the crews arrived at the pad. Of course, they'll have a couple of opportunities to pause as they make their way up. There'll be some uh, photo opportunities uh, for them to take a mental picture of the rocket itself, uh, look up from below before they climb into the capsule. Now, Crew 5 is NASA and SpaceX's fifth crew rotation to the International Space Station since 2020. The successful NASA program is called Commercial Crew. It's based right here at the Kennedy Space Center. Time now to join Megan Cruz. She is live on top of the operations and support building number two with one of the leaders of this program. Megan. Daryl, thank you so much. Yes, we are here with Phil McAllister, director of NASA's Commercial Space Division. Phil, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you. All happy right. to be here. Well, today, you know, we just saw the crew arrive at the pad. This is NASA's Crew 5 um, uh, with SpaceX. How has working with these commercial companies benefited NASA? So we both benefit. I think that's what's key with these partnerships. Obviously, SpaceX benefits from our 50 years of human spaceflight experience, but we also benefit by seeing these commercial companies and how they do business and how innovative they can be. Right. And we find there's new ways of doing things that maybe we haven't thought of. So I, I see the partnership as benefiting, benefiting both groups. It's kind of like when we first started working with the Russians. Um, they had a very different way of doing business, and I think both programs benefited from that experience. Right. But it's not just the commercial crew program. How else have we uh, fostered commercial space and sending more people and science to, to low Earth orbit? Well, I think it all started with the commercial cargo program in 2005. Uh, that was the first... Um, I think real commercial partnership that we had, certainly on the human spaceflight side. So then we had this cargo capability, mm -hmm. and then we advanced that to crew, and now we can launch people uh, to low Earth orbit and the International Space Station. And the thing that we have on our horizon, the thing that I'm working on right now, is destinations or commercial space stations. We know the space station, the International Space Station, uh, is going to be retired in 2030. Uh, we need to have continuous access to space and a destination to go to. So now we want commercial companies to build a private space station where we can just be one of many customers. Yeah, and to that end, what are we doing to encourage that? We have four agreements and contracts with companies now, Axiom Space, NanoRacks, Blue Origin, and Northrop Grumman. Hmm. They all have different concepts and they all have um, different transportation modes and they all are kind of targeting different markets so it's really interesting this is sort of the early development time okay. and I think things will shake out I don't think we'll have a big enough market to keep four uh, space stations on orbit so this is the time when they innovate and they're competing and it's kind of cool to see each one of these stations and how they develop. And again, why is this important to us? Why do we want to be one of many customers in low Earth orbit? So I think there's lots of reasons. Number one, when we first still started building the International Space Station, there wasn't any other space stations mm -hmm. that we could use at that time, so NASA had to build it. But today, we can leverage private sector investment uh, because there are other customers other than NASA who want to go to low Earth orbit and either for science or just to look out the window or whatever, for whatever reason. So we can take advantage of that. We don't have to pay for the entire infrastructure. Right. We can just be a customer and just pay our own sort of uh, fare for what we do. And so it's more beneficial for NASA. And then we can take that savings and put it into our Moon Mars initiative. I really feel like the Artemis 
mission, the SLS and the Orion that was on the pad and we will hopefully launch uh, next month, yep. I don't think it would be as far along as it is today if it weren't for our commercial partnerships hmm. because they helped save us money and we could take that savings and put it into our deep space exploration programs. Yeah, and you said personally this is what you've been working on for years now. How does it make you feel knowing that, as you just said, you know, the, the success we've had with commercial space is really fueling what, what we will see in the future with NASA? It's been very gratifying, <laughs> I have to say. You know, when we were first starting out, I had to say, I think this will work. I think this is going to be a better way mm -hmm. uh, to do this particular mission. But I didn't have any proof. But then in 2012, we launched the first Falcon to the International Space Station for the cargo program. Right. That showed that the model could work. And then in 2020, we had Bob and Doug, who flew on the Demo-2 mission, went to the International Space Station. That was just, uh, it was just an amazing oh, mission. that's great. Yeah, yeah. And Bob, we have, he's co-hosting the show today. So that's full circle, how we're coming yes. here. Can you imagine? It's Crew 5. And just uh, a, a couple of years ago, we had Bob flying for the first time with Doug. I know. It is amazing. I was just telling some of my relatives, I was like, oh, this is the fifth one. And they're like, what? How did it happen so fast? And uh, we go every six months. And so we tend to accumulate missions. And yeah. so we're putting the plaques on the wall outside my office, and it's getting pretty full. And that's pretty nice to see. That's absolutely great. Thank you so much, Phil, for being here. And I can't wait to watch the launch with you. Thanks Thank so much. You. Right. <laughs> Back to you guys. Thank you, Megan. T-minus two hours and 54 minutes and counting. And you must hear that a lot, Bob. But the people who, so many people were watching and following uh, your mission since it was a historic first and kind of feel an attachment uh, to what you did that day. Yeah, it was a, an exciting time, of course. I think it was a little bit strained with the COVID situation and mm. folks kind of at home watching kind of electronically rather than in person here at the causeway, potentially. And so uh, a lot folk, a lot of folks watched the mission and with the Bob and the Doug and the Space Dads, I think they made a connection and, and they appreciated, you know, just being a part of it. Doug and Bob and Bob and Doug and their excellent adventure. <laughs> I don't know about all that, but we had a <laughs> wonderful experience on board the International Space Station. And it was wonderful to watch and chronicle as you guys uh, went along, got to the space station and came back safely. And we see some beautiful shots from high above. The weather, I mentioned at the beginning, less than 10% uh, chance of violating. We've got onshore breezes here that are kicking up some waves and some rough surf conditions. That, of course, no impact to the launch today, but uh, you can see the flags flying and the clock ticking down. If you're just joining us, you're watching live coverage of SpaceX mission known as Crew-5. As we watch the first two astronauts walk out onto the pad surface, getting ready to do what, and I have to admit, this is, I have to attribute this, the rocket recline. <laughs> there it is. I, I like the way they did it kind of in coordination as well. I think that was something that Doug and I didn't quite nail on the Demo-2 mission, but I uh, appreciate them getting it sorted out by Crew-5. That was Commander Nicole Mann and Pilot Josh Cassida that just took that look up, and I mentioned the attribution. Uh, that was uh, our voice of mission control. Rob Navius came up with that phrase, so got to give him credit for that, the rocket recline. We'll get the next two mission specialists who will uh, do the same move, but for now they'll go into the elevator, the same elevator, Bob, that you rode on two missions aboard the space shuttle and Crew Dragon. That's true, Daryl. That that elevator there on the 39 Alpha launch pad is just a, a, a wonderful experience to kind of be able to bring it back into the game and be able to fly kind of, if you will, uh, slowly up to the pad surface before making a, a stairway walk up to the actual location where you walk out to the Dragon capsule. And there we see the top of the elevators well, where they'll walk out and uh, this is something that they have rehearsed a few times certainly we were here when they rehearsed it the other day during what's called a dry dress rehearsal yeah, the crew has been through this before, and like I mentioned a little bit earlier, it is really important to kind of get the nervousness out to have done these operations uh, once before. We can see uh, Nicole and, and Josh there as they've made their way out of the elevator. They'll walk around the back and make their way up the stairs uh, to the actual walkout area where they'll potentially have a chance to make a phone call, reach out to their family one more time uh, before heading out to the white room itself and climbing into the ship. And the closeout uh, team right behind them from SpaceX as they greet uh, some of the members of that team with some fist bumps. The telephone you mentioned, Bob, is there on the right-hand side of that, uh, that hallway there. But uh, what I notice is the astronauts tend to pause right about here because it looks like that is a spectacular view. 
It is, Daryl. It is their chance. Of course, you know, they, you mentioned the rocket recline where they're able to look up at the rocket. They're kind of co-level with the vehicle at this point. They're able to look out, see the ocean, see the rocket, see the capsule itself uh, before getting ready to kind of take that next step and head into the vehicle. And there you see one of the astronauts doing just that. To the right, they are looking out over Launch Complex 39A and the Space Coast. No doubt having a view that is similar to this from our flight ops team here at Kennedy. What a great shot. On the left, on the left there, you've got the launch tower, and that is the crew access arm that bridges the gap between the launch tower and the rocket on the right. And you can see, Daryl, the second two crew members getting ready to do their rocket recline, if you will, and get a chance to look up at the vehicle. Uh, I know they're excited to get their chance to climb in and, and strap down. Not quite as perfect and in sync as, uh, as Josh and uh, Nicole were, but they did a great job. Uh, again, better than Bob and Doug. So, <laughs> Better than Bob and Doug, but not quite as tightly choreographed as Nicole and Josh. They, they nailed it. Nonetheless, they get a great view right before they make their way into their spacecraft and that will ultimately take them into space. We've got a split screen now. The two mission specialists on the left and to the right, we're tracking our pilot and commander. Now they stagger the astronauts in this fashion because everything is highly proceduralized, right? As they go through the lines check off the, the mission milestones and then also it, it's carefully choreographed because you want to have everybody being orderly as they get into the spacecraft. Absolutely, Daryl. There is a well choreographed uh, checklist that the SpaceX team has on their tablets as they follow along with the crew accomplishing the steps in front of them. But remember, there's just a single hatchway and they need to go in in sequence and it wouldn't be helpful for all four of them to be there at the same time. So uh, we do bring them in in sequence and uh, Nicole boarding first, followed by the rest of the crew. Looking at the launch tower there, pad 39A. Bob, this is the same launch tower that launched the space shuttle. It's been, of course, renovated by SpaceX. They've made them a lot of improvements in order to accommodate the Falcon 9, but it also has some throwback to the shuttle era. And there's part of the, the fixed service structure uh, that's still a part of that structure today. That's true, Daryl. The 39 Alpha launch complex was modified to be able to handle the Falcon 9 rocket. Um, and Doug and I were super excited to launch again from the exact same location. There are remnants of the shuttle program that are still kind of out there. There's a a series of chevrons you can kind of see them in the in the image there the uh, kind of the yellow pathway if you will the crews go in the opposite direction there they, those chevrons point towards the slide wire baskets that they would use if they needed to do an emergency egress off the pad surface those slide wire baskets are a legacy item from the shuttle program and here we go the first two astronauts to board crew dragon on the left josh cassida and on the right commander nicole mann all smiles as they make their way down the crew access arm. You can see the fist pumps. They're definitely getting excited now as they get ready to board the ship. And they make their way into what's called the white room. Do a photo op there. Core on countdown. T and you can see two the space. Hours and 47 minutes. Crew have arrived at the white room just a little bit ahead of schedule. There's the announcement. And uh, you can see one of the SpaceX techs handed Nicole Mann and Josh a Sharpie, which this is something that's actually on their to do list for launch operations. And what they're going to do now is sign their signature onto the NASA meatball or right there around it. That NASA meatball is encircled with signatures from all the previous NASA crews that have gone up to the International Space Station. That signature would include yours, Bob, as well as your wife, Megan MacArthur. Yes, Joe, that's a nice tradition that the SpaceX team added and uh, allowed kind of Doug and I to get started. And uh, it's pretty neat to get your name added to the wall there, the, the white room wall that leads to the Dragon capsules that head to Space Station. And there you see her putting her signature, making the way around 
the NASA meatball. Handing off the pen to Josh. And to the right, you see the SpaceX logo for their commercial missions. They're also starting a set of signatures, which is a great sign about starting to establish that uh, economy in low Earth orbit, the commercialization of low Earth orbit. It's, it's exciting to see the, the economy in low Earth orbit continue to grow, Daryl. It's also exciting to see the cadre of astronauts continue to grow and, and view that group as, as our partners of folks who've been to low Earth orbit, who've been into the black of space, and uh, it's just exciting to see that group continue to grow. As the astronauts prepare to go inside, the first two, the commander and pilot, we've got the mission specialist on the left-hand side of your screen making their way towards the crew access arm. The white room was a term first used during the Gemini era, literally describing the color of the room, which is painted white. You can see an inflatable seal, which is black colored, connected to the spacecraft, and it inflates to create that environmental seal around the side of the spacecraft, connecting it with the white room. It does, Daryl. That seal, you know, of course, would protect if there was a kind of rain or anything else kind of going on in the area. We don't have that today. We have beautiful weather, but uh, it does ensure that the elements of Florida don't make too far of a way into the capsule itself. So you don't want any mosquitoes or anything uh, headed into orbit with you. And so that seal does its job. It does indeed. There's a lot of humidity and mosquitoes out here in Florida. Fortunately, today, we've got a, a nice little breeze that's keeping it off us here at the desk, which is nice, and kept it off the astronauts and crew when they were uh, getting in their vehicles, running about a 10-knot uh, onshore breeze, which should help push the clouds around. We've got a few of them out overhead. Our launch weather officer for today, Ryan Sizik from the 45th Space Wing, telling us that we've got a nice high-pressure system in the area, Bob, that's... Uh, Keeping everything clear as uh, the first astronaut climbs Station aboard. Station core on countdown at T minus two hours and 44 minutes. Crew have begun ingressing Dragon. You got to be careful to not bump your head. It looks like you absolutely, Daryl, need to be careful as you climb through that hatchway. There's a pressure seal that needs to be kind of maintained in pristine condition. So when the time comes to close the hatch, you'll actually get a good seal with that, that hatch closure operation. And so the crew is uh, uh, keenly aware that they need to protect that environment and that they climb into the vehicle very carefully. Carefully stepping over that seal, that, uh, that's important. And later we'll see the closeout team closely inspecting that seal just to make sure that there's no debris, no what they call FOD for an object debris, which could compromise the seal, something you want to make sure you keep the environment on the inside and space on the outside. Yeah, that's absolutely true. That team, of course, it's a little bit difficult in the suit itself to be able to monitor and make sure that you don't bump anything that you're not supposed to bump into, but uh, that team of SpaceX folks just does a great job with assisting the crew, letting them do as much as they, they would like to do on their own, but also ensuring that everything's done perfectly so that uh, nothing has to be redone in the time critical situation for launch. And here come our second two astronauts, mission specialists Koichi Wakata and Ana Kikana. They're next up in the white room. Big thumbs up from Koichi. He's the veteran of this uh, group, uh, Bob. We've got three first-time flyers and a guy that has a lot of experience in space. That's true, Daryl. You know, Koichi was in the astronaut office when I arrived uh, a couple decades ago, you know, just having joined and, and trained as a shuttle astronaut, getting the opportunity to fly on his third space vehicle kind of going forward here. It's got to be exciting for him to try on a new spaceship. I'm making his fifth flight into space. Got the green light flashing above, and I'm going to take that as green as go. <laughs> Certainly better than a red flashing light. <laughs> yes.
So it does take a relatively large team. It does seem like, uh, you know, the crew being able to head out to the launch pad and climb in uh, almost by themselves would be a be a thing. But uh, in order to make sure that things are all done perfectly, that team of SpaceX folks uh, follows along very carefully with the procedure to just to make sure everything's done exactly uh, per the checklist. And our mission specialists will now put their signatures on the white room as the commander and pilot finish up securing their five-point harness uh, into their uh, seat, getting a snug fit, as you can see there, Josh Kassina, making sure everything is lined up correctly. Looks like he's got four hands. <laughs> but those are his gloves. I'm sure an extra set of hands couldn't hurt. Yeah, no, he just has the two hands, uh, just like the rest of us, but he does have the, the gloves there kind of taken off to kind of give him some additional dexterity as he tries to work through getting all the strap-in process completed. You mentioned the five-point harness, uh, much like a racing harness that the astronauts uh, strap in with. Uh, likely they won't need all of the capability of that harness as they head into orbit and take their ride, uh, but it does have a provide some capability should the emergency escape system be activated to really keep them strapped tightly into their seats. Seats that are also um, sized to your proportions, right? And uh, the suit is custom, but the seat, I, I believe, has three different sizes. I believe small, medium, and large. The, the seat has some different sizes. The armrest have some different lengths, and the fit rest have some different lengths. So there are several adjustments that can be made, not quite uh, completely custom, but uh, it does, uh, I guess, with you look at all the way up to Crew 5, we probably haven't exercised all the options that are out there, but uh, uh, definitely have some flexibility in customizing the seat to make it fit the astronaut. And interesting note about the spacecraft endurance that uh, SpaceX and NASA rec recently uh, hitting a really uh, incredible joint milestone. Crew 5 is uh, SpaceX, of course, is eighth crewed mission since May of 2020, but as of this mission, Bob Dragon is now certified for five times reuse. Prior to that, it was one time reuse, but they've gone through the process with NASA and accomplished that uh, reuse milestone, which that's impressive. We'll see more flights from Endurance. That's true, Daryl. It, it is really critical that these commercial vehicles kind of meet their reuse milestones, you know, so that we can continue servicing the International Space Station by rotating crews. And so it's a huge accomplishment to get that behind folks so that we can continue planning for, you know, the duration of Space Station's lifetime uh, being accessible by the Dragon capsule. We continue to watch the action live. In the meantime, let's toss it out back to California with Jesse and Sandra. Thanks, Daryl. This is always an exciting moment watching the crew climb aboard Dragon. This phase of the mission is also referred to as crew ingress, and that term ingress is used when crew members are getting into a spacecraft or airlock, while egress means the exact opposite, they're exiting. So prior to getting on board, the crew completed a foreign object debris check or FOD check. And that means they themselves have to be inspected for any substances or debris that isn't supposed to be on them or their spacesuits because this could potentially cause damage to Dragon. And that's also why the crew is wearing covers on their boots and on the umbilical port of their spacesuits. Those covers get removed before they enter the spacecraft. Foreign object debris prevention actually begins right here in Hawthorne before the spacecraft leaves SpaceX headquarters and is carefully controlled all the way through launch day until Dragon's hatch is closed. They are now getting buckled in and attaching their umbilicals to their suits. And you can see the suit techs or closeout techs are present, helping them out as needed. The umbilicals allow the crew to have comms through their suit, air to help keep them cool, as well as delivers nitrox for suit pressurization. As we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, the suit's primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin depressurization. And there are four seats configured right now inside of Dragon and are numbered one to four from right to left when looking at the seats from the hatch. Anna Kikino will be in seat one on the very far left, and you see she just climbed in a couple of moments ago. Nicole, Nicole Mann will be, Josh Cassida will be in seat two, where the commander's uh, seat, and Josh Cassida will be beside her in the pilot seat. And then on the very end is Koichi Wakata, who is in seat four, all the way to the right, who just climbed aboard just a moment ago as well. 
And directly in front of the crew members are three displays, which they'll use throughout the flight, getting insight into Dragon's systems, seeing any alerts or issues with the vehicle, and if required, taking control and manually flying Dragon. Now, once the crew is all settled in, coming up will be a comm check, and that will be to make sure that they can communicate with mission control. And then, once that's complete, their, suit, their seats will be rotated in position for launch. So very exciting watching them getting settled in. We've got this awesome view of the Falcon 9 with Dragon on top, crew on board already. We have been watching the crew since this morning, make their way to the launch pad, climb up the fixed service structure, walk across that beautiful crew arm that you see there on your screen. And now they are getting settled into each one of their seats. And there is the crew five crew there on your right hand screen. And the crew will remain in these spacesuits through the ascent portion of today's flight. They'll be able to get out of their suits and get a little more comfortable short shortly after um, liftoff, but for the portion that is the most dynamic portion of the flight, they will remain in those spacesuits. Uh, and the primary function of the spacesuits is to protect the crew in an event of a cabin depressurization. And if that would occur, the suit could inflate to provide a habitable, habitable environment long enough for the crew to return home. But with the crew now inside of the Dragon vehicle, let's go ahead and check in with Kate Tice for the latest. How's it going, Kate? I've been following along with the launch teams and they continue to work through the countdown. Currently, no issues are in work uh, and we are awaiting the comm checks uh, with the crew inside Dragon, which you seated there. Um, the first check that we will hear is to check the umbilical, which is the harness that is attached from each spacesuit to the vehicle itself. You can actually see the umbilical port there on the right thigh. Um, it's that little black box, that's the umbilical port that connects the spacesuit to their seat. Um, the second check that we'll hear will check the ground stations, uh, which as the name suggests, are the ground-based support staff here on Earth. And then the third comm check that we'll hear will be for TDRIS or the tracking and data relay satellites. Uh, and those are, uh, that's a constellation of 10 geosynchronous satellites that help us maintain contact around the globe. Um, as of right now, the Dragon Launch Op team uh, uh, tracking no issues. Um, I was listening in uh, throughout the webcast on their nets, and it sounds like that we are running perfectly on time and just a little bit early. Uh, we have plenty of margin. So if for you know, whatever reason something arises and we need a little bit extra time to work through an issue, uh, we, we've got it in the countdown. Um, for those that are new to our launch webcasts, of course, our countdown uh, is the framework that helps to sync all of our teams up. Uh, so we build margin into each step uh, that we walk through uh, or proceed through uh, on the countdown to make sure that we have plenty of time to work any issues that might arise. Um, so with all that being said, everything is looking good on the Dragon side. As for the Falcon 9 team, uh, they are located in firing room four uh, in the launch control center at Kennedy Space Center, which you see there on your screen. Um, those folks are settling in for final checkouts, propellant loading, and launch. Uh, the Falcon 9 team will undergo their own comm checks with the crew at about the T-minus two-hour mark. Uh, as for the range, they continue to report no issues, and the weather forecast continues to be acceptable. We had a less than 10% chance of violation of our weather conditions, and as you can see on your screen, uh, it's a beautiful morning there at Kennedy Space Center. Now, of course, we are looking at weather not only at the launch site, but around the world. We need to make sure that uh, conditions are acceptable if Dragon has to splash down in the, in the Atlantic in case of an escape. But we're also monitoring contingency splashdown locations if the crew had to come back to Earth before docking with the space station. Now, if that were to happen, SpaceX and NASA would coordinate with the U.S. Coast Guard to ensure safety upon splashdown, including extra ships and air assets to patrol the 10 nautical mile keep out zone. Uh, that's, of course, to help mitigate safety concerns for any boaters approaching the landing area. And, of course, we've also been monitoring downrange weather, uh, which, as I reported earlier, was no-go uh, yesterday, but at the T-6 
our weather brief turn to green. So uh, we're proceeding, uh, but keeping an eye on those downrange wind conditions. So as the clock continues to tick, we're approaching the T minus two hour and 31 minute mark. All systems to continue to be go for launch. Let's head back over to Jesse, who's actually here in Hawthorne with me just across the floor. Thanks, Kate. Not only is today an exciting day because it's launch day, but it's also a pretty exciting year as this year marks Dragon's 10th year in operational flight. It took a lot of love and dedication to get here today, and we are still learning and innovating from each launch. From the beginning, Dragon was designed to eventually fly people. The Dragon hanging from the ceiling next to us was initially flown to certify SpaceX for cargo missions to the space station over 10 years ago, which flew in 2010. Yet a window was added to hint at our plans for flying crew in the near future. Now, of course, the Dragon behind us and the Dragon supporting today's mission taking Crew-5 to the space station are very different, a testament to how far we've come. It's been a little over two years since we flew Demo 2, which was on May 30th of 2020. And since then, SpaceX has been regularly flying crew missions for NASA to and from the International Space Station at an average cadence of one flight every six months since Crew 1. Crew 5 marks SpaceX's sixth crewed spaceflight for NASA and our eighth human spaceflight mission overall, including private passenger missions Inspiration 4 and Axiom 1. Now, speaking of Inspiration4, you may remember Jared Isaacman, who served as commander for the Inspiration4 mission. Jared is planning to return to space with us under the Polaris program. Now, through this program, Jared, along with his crew, will embark on three human spaceflight missions, culminating in the inaugural flight of SpaceX's Starship with humans on board. The crew for the first mission, Polaris Dawn, has been busy preparing for their flight, which is currently targeted for no earlier than March 2023. In addition to Jared Isaacman, the Polaris Dawn crew consists of Scott Kidd Poteet, the mission's pilot, SpaceX's Sarah Gillis as mission specialist, and SpaceX's Anna Menon, the second mission specialist and medical officer, and there you can see them on the screen. The Polaris Dawn mission will endeavor to fly higher than any other Dragon mission to date. The crew will also be attempting the world's first ever commercial spacewalk using our newly designed EVA suits. And our progress with human space exploration does not stop there. As you can see, we've started construction on a new Starship pad at Kennedy Space Center, the same pad that will take NASA's human space lander system to the moon. NASA's efforts, particularly with the commercial crew program and the certification of the SpaceX Dragon, are aiding in building the foundation for a robust U.S.-led commercial economy in low Earth orbit. Commercial transportation to space is but one element of NASA's larger plan for commercialization, and we're enabling the development of commercial space stations, private astronaut missions to station, demand for in-space manufacturing, and much more. And soon, the agency will launch Artemis to the moon and beyond as part of a test flight of the Space Launch System SpaceX rocket. Dragon, ready for comm checks. Copy Dragon, stand by for umbilical comp check. And we did just hear those words that comm checks will be starting here shortly. Um, so the Orion spacecraft and all of its components will be tested from end to end in this uncrewed test flight. This is a key milestone before we fly humans on board as part of Artemis 2 and then have humans land on the moon on Artemis 3. Now on your screen, you're seeing some waves, some thumbs up, some goodbyes to the team on the ground. Once they close ADR, this hatch. PLT, MS1, MS2, comm check. CDR has you loud and clear. PLT has you loud and clear. MS1 uh, has you loud and clear. MS2 has you loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Umbilical comm check is complete. Stand by for ground station comm check.
and those comm checks have begun. We're going to hear a series of those communication checks to make sure that the crew can hear the folks on the ground and vice versa. And looks like the crew is very excited, waving at the camera to the world. Maybe some poses for some photos there as well. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And as I was saying um, right before the comm checks started, once they close this hatch, that's the last human being they're going to see on Earth until they splash down in a few months from now. You can also see the crew uh, with their iPads on, their, their tablets on, their um, legs there. They have a variety of different um, procedures and reference materials that they can view during the mission as well. You'll see them getting that configured and ready for launch now, uh, two hours and 25 minutes from now. And these procedures are very, very specific. They are following them all the way, step by step, all the way through. This does include, if you're just now joining us, we are awaiting some comm checks, which they have begun. And they will be stepping through several different comm checks to make sure that the crew can hear and communicate with the ground teams here in Mission Control. And we will do those comm checks through multiple paths to Dragon, including Tedris and ground stations, which you'll hear coming up throughout the continuation of these comm checks. The ground, of course, refers to the different ground stations, and SpaceX has ground stations all around the globe. And then you'll also hear from CORE, MD, and LD. The CORE in Hawthorne is the Crew Operations and Resource Engineer. The LD is the launch director down in Florida and oversees the space, uh, the countdown ops. And then MD is the mission director here in Hawthorne, is, who is the overall flight lead for SpaceX. I just love the excitement of this crew. <laughs> and this is a pretty cool view inside of Dragon. You can see the four seats for the four crew members, but Dragon's actually designed to have up to seven crew members. So right below this row of seats, um, there can fit three additional seats. Today, since we only have four crew members, below the crew that you see on your screen is actually cargo stowed inside of Dragon. Dragon, SpaceX, comm check. SpaceX, Dragon, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Ground station comm check is complete. Stand by for Tedris comm check. We did have a good comm check with the core standing by for the next comm check, which is going to be Tedris, and that's... Dragon, SpaceX, comm check. SpaceX, Dragon, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Tedris comm check is complete. Stand by for comm checks with DC, MD, and LD in the launch configuration. Dragon, DC on countdown one, comm check. DC, Dragon, loud and clear. DC, loud and clear. Stand by for comm checks with MD. Dragon, MD on count on one, comm check. MD, Dragon, loud and clear. MD, loud and clear, stand by for comm check over Dragon the ground. Dragon, MD, Dragon the ground, comm check. MD, Dragon, loud and clear. MD, loud and clear. Stand by for comm checks with LD. Dragon.
Dragon LD on countdown one, comm check. LD, Dragon, loud and clear. LD, loud and clear. Standby for comm check over Dragon to ground. Dragon, LD on Dragon to ground, comm check. LD, Dragon, loud and clear. And LD, loud and clear. Let's go have some fun. Dragon, SpaceX. Launch configuration comm checks are complete. Report when ready for seat rotation per section 2 of 4.100. And now that we have successful calm checks, let's go over to the Johnson Space Station. Dragon, we are ready for section two and ready for seat rotation. Looks like the crew is getting ready for seat rotation, that, but let's we head over to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and check in with Shaniqua Vereen. Thanks, Sandra, and welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room, or Mission Control Center, Houston. A team of flight controllers behind me is actively monitoring the space station as we speak. The crew in orbit has completed a number of tasks to prepare for prepare the station for Crew 5, like setting up tools to monitor Dragon's arrival and preparing the sleep stations for the new residents. Many of their clothes and other belongings launched on a previous cargo resupply mission. Back here in Houston, Flight Director Greg Whitney and his team are in constant communication with the SpaceX Mission Director for Crew-5's launch to the space station. Once we get into integrated operations, the NASA Flight Director will be conducting a series of go-no-go -no -go polls at the predetermined checkpoints for Dragon's approach. For now, we'll continue to follow along from here in Mission Control Houston, so I'll send it back down to the team in Kennedy. Over to you, Daryl. All right, thank you, Shaniqua. And if you're just joining us, it is T-minus two hours and 19 minutes until Crew-5 launches as part of the NASA Commercial Crew Program. We've got Commander Nicole Mann, Pilot Josh Cassida, and Mission Specialist Koichi Wakata and Anna Kikina. They are strapped into their seats inside Dragon Endurance. I'm Daryl Nail, and this is Bob Benkin, history-making astronaut here. If you want to get a question into Bob live on the show, just... Hop on to a social media platform, any of the following, Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch. We're streaming on Facebook as well. Use the hashtag AskNASA, and we will take your question live on the air to Bob Binken. Now, the Commercial Crew Program has hundreds of super smart engineers and technicians doing amazing work to get us up to the station, and Megan Cruz is with one of them. Megan. Yes, I do have a super smart Dragon. engineer with me. This is Crystal Jones. She's with CCP's Grounds and Mission Operations Office. Crystal, can you tell everyone what that office is in charge of? Sure, yeah. Uh, we have a wide, wide range of um, functions that we do for the commercial crew program. Uh, one is assessing ground systems okay. for um, crew safety for both launch ops and recovery. Mm -hmm. An example of a ground system is the crew access arm, which we just saw the crew walk through mm -hmm. um, to get to the spacecraft and ingress the spacecraft. That arm has to swing away from the vehicle for launch, mm -hmm. but if there were some sort of emergency and the astronauts needed to get out of the spacecraft, that arm needs to come back really quickly to allow the astronauts to egress. Um, so you're responsible for just making sure that everything is operating the way that it should be, if that were to happen. Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah. And then right after this, you're also going to go to the nearby Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. You're going to be inside a room there, and I believe we have a live shot of that room. And you're going to go there so that you can serve as CCP's mishap manager, right? This is the room right here. Yes, that's correct. And I have my FAA and NTSB colleagues uh, there with me as well. Since this is a, an FAA commercially licensed mission, they have mishap jurisdiction for some of the um, phases of flight. And so we all work together if an incident were to occur. I don't expect anything to happen. Mm -hmm. I have full confidence in the uh, joint NASA and SpaceX team. You have such an important role here. Like you said, a wide variety of things that you're overseeing. You've been here at NASA for almost 15 years. I mean, did you know that you always wanted to work here and how did you make it happen? Yes, I did always know <laughs> that I wanted to work at NASA. Ever since I was a, a very young girl, I dreamed of working for NASA. 
Um, unfortunately, when I was about uh, 10, 11, 12, um, my parents' drug and alcohol use um, began to impact our lives in a severe way. We ended up homeless, uh, had to stay in an abandoned bus, um, oh and eventually transitioned to a homeless shelter. Wow. Um, after that time, um, it, we never seemed to be able to recover as a family. We lived in um, extreme poverty in a bad neighborhood, um, but it didn't stop me from trying to reach my goals. I still had that dream. So um, in high school, I learned how to use a computer. No one in my area had a computer. Wow. I didn't have one, didn't know. So learned how to use a computer, researched um, colleges, how to apply, how to get applications, the whole financial aid process. Wow. Um, and I was accepted into Florida Institute of Technology here in Melbourne, Florida, and got a bachelor's in astrophysics and wow. a master's in space systems. Wow, you're not even at NASA, and you've had <laughs> such a, a long road ahead of you, but but I hope that people learn to, to take away from your story that really you can just follow your dreams if you have a passion for it to yeah. do it, right? That would be your message. Yeah, and I'm said. happy to say that, that my parents have conquered the, their oh, addictions. That's wonderful. And I was extremely proud of my mom before her passing earlier this year. In fact, this necklace that I'm wearing is made with her ashes. Wow. And I wear it for every launch um, in her memory. And I'm sure she's very proud of you. Crystal, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. We'll send it back to you guys. Thank you so much, Megan. What a powerful story from Crystal Jones, the CCP Ground and Mission Operations Office. That is inspiring to hear how she came from that difficult background to where she is now. Absolutely, Daryl. And it's amazing too when you when you think about going through a difficult road like that and then achieving such a high level of uh, accomplishment here at NASA. We're just so proud of uh, Crystal Jones and thank you Crystal for sharing that story with us. We want to introduce you now to today's crew. If you're just joining us now, you're looking inside the capsule Dragon, endurance. You are go for section 3 suit leak check preparation. Dragon is a go for suit leak check preparation section 3 of 4.100. And there you hear the confirmation that the crew is ready to begin their suit leak checks. Let's start off by talking about our commander for the day as they pull down their visors. She is the second from the right of your screen. Nicole Mann, the California native, holds a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering. She is a colonel in the Marine Corps. She was an F-A-18 Hornet and Super Hornet test pilot and deployed twice aboard aircraft carriers in support of combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Nicole was selected by NASA in June of 2013 and in the years that followed led the astronaut corps in the development of hardware in the Artemis program. Today the Crew-5 commander will be flying into space for the first time and after Crew-5 Crew launches she will be the first Native American woman to go to space which is a wonderful accomplishment. Absolutely. Nicole joined the astronaut office when I was the chief of the astronaut office. I'm just super excited to see a colonel in the Marine Corps uh, head to the International Space Station from that commander seat, just like we had for Demo 2. And you being a colonel uh, in the Air Force, um, I'm sure you appreciate uh, the military discipline that she brings to that role, just like your partner, Doug Hurley, brought a little bit of that. Sitting next to Nicole is Josh Cassida. He grew up in Bear Lake, Minnesota. The physicist and U.S. Navy test pilot flew 23 combat missions. He later became an instructor at the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School. Hey, listen, Dragon, we have tear complete and complete with Section 3. There you hear the call that the leak checks have been completed. Good sign as we move forward. And I believe that was Josh Cassidy that came over the line there, who we are talking about. Copy that, Dragon. You are go for Section 4 suit leak check. That was a confirmation, rather, that they were to begin the suit leak check. Right? Correct. Dragon is go for suit leak check, section four. All right, want to correct that. Cassida, he's one of more than 100 graduates who became astronauts going back to the Mercury program. More recently, he served as capsule communicator in mission control. But, Bob, today he's in the position of pilot aboard Dragon, and that's a position you know well. Yes, it's, it's quite exciting to see Josh in, in that seat. You know, as all of our astronauts who come into the program, he brings a balance of operational and, and scientific uh, expertise kind of to the mission in front of him. 
in the role of mission specialist is veteran Japanese astronaut Koichi Wakata. He has a doctorate in aerospace engineering and in 1996 became the first Japanese mission specialist aboard the space shuttle Endeavour for STS-72. Altogether, Koichi flew four space shuttle missions, a Russian Soyuz, and was on a long-duration stay aboard the International Space Station. During his two-decade career as an astronaut, Koichi has spent 11 months in space, and so he is the guy with the experience on this crew, the other three first-time flyers. Joining Koichi in the role of mission specialist is Roscosmos cosmonaut Anna Kikina. She graduated from the Novosibirsk State Academy of Water Transport in 2006. In 2012, Anna officially became a candidate for the position of test cosmonaut. Crew 5 will be Anna's first flight into space. Now let's check in with our team out at Hawthorne, California. Kate Tice, what do you have? Thanks, Daryl. I'm following along with the launch countdown and our procedures. Uh, we're now coming up to T minus two hours and 10 minutes. As you can see there on your screen, the crew is ready for it. leak checks. Those should be commencing uh, any moment now. Uh, the countdown is proceeding nominally at this point on board the brand new Dragon spacecraft Endurance. We've already heard those communication checks between the Dragon team and the crew. Uh, we will hear checks, comm checks, so there's about a, I'm hearing there's about a minute remaining in that leak check. Um, there will be another communication check with the Falcon 9 launch team and the crew that comes up at about T minus two hours. Uh, so at this point, we are, we're in the leak check, uh, less than a minute remaining. Um, and after that, um, we'll be able to say leak checks are hopefully good. And at that point, the closeout lead will then verify that the cabin environments inside Dragon uh, are good to go and then begin procedures to close the side hatch of the Dragon spacecraft. Uh, so that's always an exciting moment, of course. The closeout team will perform uh, the final leak check on the hatch, and then once that is finished, the team will begin all their steps to ready the crew access arm for retraction, and then the closeout team will leave the pad at about T minus one hour, and we'll hear that called out on the nets um, that the team has departed the pad. Uh, and at that point in time, only our crew five astronauts will remain on the pad. Now, as for Falcon 9, uh, that team is on console in firing room four. They are preparing um, for their communication checks, uh, which will occur at T minus one hour and 55 minutes. Uh, SpaceX engineers have pressurized the launch vehicle gas storage bottles. Uh, those are composite overwrap pressure vessels, or COPVs. They contain gases that are used to fill tanks with hot helium uh, as propellant is um, that are filled with propellant, uh, or to be filled with hot helium as propellant is drained out of the first and, and second that, stages. We saw the same uh, we will while we just confirmed those results long term and then for uh, next actions. Dragon copies and stand in line. So as the propellant is drained out of the first and second stages, uh, we'll top those off in the last half hour or so uh, before liftoff those COPDs. Now we also use pressurized gases to spin the Merlin engine turbo pump when we start an engine in space. The second stage MBAC engine starts up after the first stage separates and then the first stage engines need to be restarted for that landing sequence. Uh, the gases are also used for ad attitude control systems which help the, with the, help the vehicle with its orientation. Uh, for deploying the grid fins and landing legs. Now, of course, we're continuing to keep an eye on the weather. You can see it remains a beautiful day at pad 39A. Uh, we are watch watching weather at the launch site as well as around the world uh, for contingency abort and landing zones. And Dragon SpaceX for suit leak checks. And it sounds like we're going to get confirmation on those leak checks now. Go ahead, SpaceX. All right, Josh. We saw you come in a little bit lower than you did on dry dress, so just as a measure of precaution, we're going to have a closeout lead come in and just take a quick look and double check that everything is looking secure for zippers and umbilicals. How copy? We copy and we were thinking the same. Thanks a lot. Good read. 
All right, so it sounds like pilot Josh Cassida, um, his his suit pressure is a little bit lower than what we read during the dry dress, which was the basically dress rehearsal that we performed early on Sunday, October 2nd. So the team, the closeout team, is going to come back in and just make sure that all of the zippers on the spacesuit are zipped up to the appropriate height, just make sure that everything is locked into place. So um, we have plenty of margin in the launch countdown. Uh, the countdown is uh, to make sure that all the teams are working toward T0 in a coordinated fashion, and we have lots of margin uh, built in. So we are okay to go in and recheck that and reperform that suit, that suitly check on Josh. Uh, so at this point in time, um, everything continues to be acceptable for launch. We're coming up to T minus two hours and six minutes. Uh, so I'm going to toss it back to Daryl over at Kennedy Space Center. All right. Thank you, Kate. And I'm here with Bob Binkin, astronaut from Demo 2 and uh, NASA's first mission. And uh, we want to talk a little bit about that uh, leak check. Uh, Bob, you were following along as they were doing the checks. Um, the crew now going inside uh, to double check Josh Cassidy's suit. What's that all about? Yeah, that's that's correct, Daryl. You know, we heard the words from the SpaceX team. What they saw was a slightly different indication than they saw during Josh's last leak check. And the team is just going to double check that to make sure that they don't see anything awry. Just an abundance of caution. As you heard, the crew reported that they had a good leak check. And so the team's just using, again, an abundance of caution. And a little bit of air obviously comes through that suit and goes out the suit. Right. So this is a level that would be maybe a little higher than than what they normally see. That's correct. All right, very good. Well, we're back here at Kennedy, and the weather is beautiful launch as we stand by. And there you can see the suit tech in there examining uh, the zippers and the connection points in Josh Cassida's suit. So they, uh, they hadn't shut the hatch yet, so that was an easy entry for that tech to go in there and check on that. Yeah, so they'll check each of the places where there could possibly be a leak. One of the places is that umbilical that you've seen them uh, disconnect, and they're now reattaching after they checked the seal that was there. They'll verify the zippers that are on the suit to make sure that those are all closed all the way to the very end. And uh, I know that uh, for the crew, these sorts of situations can be a, a little bit uh, frustrating. They can kind of break the, the sequence of events, but I know they'll get right back on track here and uh, uh, continue. All right, these are... Highly trained astronauts that have been getting ready for this moment uh, for the past couple of years. Certainly ready for all situations that uh, they may come up against. And these suits, Bob, carry a lot right into the spacecraft. I'm dragging, I'm dragging ground from C3. How do you hear? C3, I've got you five by five. How me? Got you the same. Thank you. So I don't, I don't want to speculate too much, but when you pull the uh, umbilical away, you know, there's an opportunity for the comm system to just uh, need to be re-verified. So we heard Josh check back in. Those connection points, they're grouped together, right? You've got comm and air flowing into the suit at the same connection point? Correct. Also, uh, giving a check to Anas, or maybe just doing some zipping up and rechecking we've had uh, some social media questions coming in we've asked you to participate and we want to do that right now by asking questions of our expert astronaut Bob Binkin here Of course, you can hit us up at hashtag AskNASA on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch. And our question is coming in from Andy Hughes 01. Why do the new spacesuits involve long rubber boots? Those are high boots. You know, that's a, it's, a, it's a great question, Daryl, as to why, uh, you know, the SpaceX suit uh, looks the way that it does. Of course, as a commercial company, they were free to come up with a suit that really then had to be assessed whether it actually accomplished the mission of protecting the crew and uh, uh, in those unlikely cases where there might need to be uh, uh, an atmosphere of their own because there was something wrong with the one inside of the spaceship. And so uh, SpaceX chose the, the high boot uh, configuration there, but it's uh, met the mission needs. And so, you know, the NASA team was able to embrace it and move forward. All 
All right, we'll keep an eye on the action inside Crew Dragon Endurance and our four, our three astronauts and one cosmonaut who are standing by. The uh, member of the closeout crew has and exited Dragon the capsule. SpaceX, we got a report from the closeout lead about verifying all the zippers and umbilicals. We're just chatting with a few more folks to see if there's any other actions we want to take at this time. We do have 15 minutes remaining in the margin here, so plenty of time. Okay, Dragon Captain. All right, there you heard the discussion between SpaceX and the NASA astronauts. And so, although going into space is not child's play, every Dragon astronaut crew brings a stuffed toy with them. And there's one inside the capsule right now. We're going to you know, step away from this part of the, uh, the operation. Of course, we'll keep an eye on it, make sure we, that, nothing, uh, that nothing happens that we don't make you aware of while they're working on that. But we want to take a little lighter moment, right, and uh, look at the stuffed toys that are inside the crew. We don't know what the, uh, or at least most people don't know, what's inside uh, Crew 5's uh, capsule at the moment. But it has a purpose. When the toy starts floating, the strapped-in crew has confirmation they've reached microgravity. The toy is called a zero-G indicator, and there's been a half dozen or so on Dragon so far, starting with this little guy who can forget plush Earth floating around by himself on the first uncrewed test flight in 2017 called Demo-1. And that's Anne McLean there. She was the one that received it. And that was followed up by a sequin bedazzled dinosaur named Trevor, picked out by those fellows right there. Bob and Doug, Doug Hurley's son, Jack, and Bob's son, Theo. Crew One then took a toy baby Grogu with them to the uh, first four-person crew when they reached space. But since then, well, it's been all stuffed animals. A penguin for Crew Two, and a turtle for Crew Three, and a turtle and a chimp for Crew Four, as you can see there. And so right here on set, Bob was kind enough to bring tremor with him that you saw floating around in his uh, capsule. Uh, this is actually tremor, the one that went up into space. That's true, Daryl. This is the actual tremor. It's got the tether still installed, if you will, that we use <laughs> to keep track of it so that it didn't uh, get lost on board the space station or float too far Dragon away. SpaceX for suit leak checks. There they go, starting up the suit leak checks again. Go ahead, Mike. All right, Josh, that completes the troubleshooting actions we wanted to take. So we verified that your umbilical has been reseated and your zippers are closed. Given that, we are recommending that we are that we that you proceed back to section 3 of 4.100 and reperform the suit leak check preparation and suit leak checks. I'll copy. Okay, Dragon copies. We're going to step into section 3 of 4.100 and we'll let you know when we're ready to reperform the suit leak checks. Good read back. All right, so they're going to recheck those suits. And while they do that really quickly, how did how did your son choose a <laughs> bedazzled sequined uh, dinosaur for? Well, Daryl, you know, there's never no telling what goes through the minds of two <laughs> uh, young elementary school boys, uh, my son Theo and Doug's son Jack. But uh, they had a collection, and dinosaurs were near and dear to their hearts. Uh, they went through the collections that they had in front of them, and they picked the Apatosaurus trimmer. And so I'm glad that some other folks have been able to follow along with that tradition and be able to excite a, a couple of kids, if you will, about you know flying in space, even if it's for a stuffed animal. It's great to inspire the younger generations about space with something that they can access. And can you confirm that all the sequins are still there? I, I can confirm, and I, and I do know that the teams look really closely at each of the zero-G indicators <laughs> to make sure that they're compatible with the SpaceX uh, Crew Dragons environment as well as the space station environment. And so we got approval, and we were able to take the uh, Apatosaurus trimmer with us into space. That's a neat thing, and it lives now in the Benkin household. Crew 5 is the latest launch by Kennedy's commercial crew program. And Dragon, uh, care is complete in step 3.9. We are ready for the check. Copy that, Dragon. You are go for Section 4 suit leak check. All right, while they start up the Dragon suit. Is go for suit leak check. The communication confirming they're going to restart the suit leak check. Bob Binkin telling me that the suits inflate just a little bit as they make that check. In the meantime, we'll uh, take an interview now and check in with Kennedy's commercial crew program. It was created in 2011 and has been flying astronauts from American soil to the International Space Station 
for the last two years. Let's bring in NASA's Megan Cruz, who's with Kennedy Center Director Janet Petro. I am, Daryl. Thank you so much, Janet. It's always so great to have you here, especially for a day like today. You know, we're about to launch this new crew uh, to the ISS. How do you feel about Kennedy again playing this important role in continuing what we do on the space station? Uh, well, th thank you so much, uh, Megan, for the question. And as you know, you know, Kennedy has a very long history of doing really some incredible things. And of course, we were established 60 years ago to uh, do the incredible mission of uh, landing a man on the moon and then returning him safely. And in the six decades since then, um, we've been doing an incredible amount of impactful missions. And a lot of those missions have really helped what we do here on Earth and, yeah. and for the benefit of man, man, uh, mankind here on Earth. Um, you know, that on-orbiting laboratory that we have out there, up there is doing incredible science and technology and research that's really benefiting humankind here. Yeah. Yeah, talk to us about some of the things that, that we've been able to change and impact here on Earth because we're launching and because of what we're doing here at Kennedy. Yeah, so um, it, it, it's incredible to think that 24 years ago was the first uh, section, the module of the International Space Station called Un Unity, which mm -hmm. was launched. And in that time, since then, we We've had more than 20 years of a human continuous presence on the International Space Station. And every single time we launch a vehicle, whether it's a cargo or crew, we send up science and, and cargo and payloads where we do science research and technology development. And, that, and all of that not only benefits what we do here on Earth, um, uh, promoting uh, technology and, and bettering our life here, but also yeah. it helps us to look forward to when we go back to the moon uh, and then on to Mars. I'll talk about a few um, uh, projects that we do here at Kennedy that I'm really proud of. One is uh, the M-SOLO. It's a commercial off-the-shelf mass spectrometer mm -hmm. um, that'll help us seek out and search for ice on the lunar surface. Wow. Um, and then, uh, of course, we do, um, we are the, the experts resident here at Kennedy for plant biology. And as we're going to be sending our astronauts further and further into space, uh, to the moon and uh, and then on to Mars, you know, they're going to want some fresh food. And so that <laughs> plant research is really going to help uh, enable that to uh, sure. happen. Yeah. And of course, you're alluding to Artemis One, you know, right behind us is the iconic vehicle assembly building. Inside there is our Artemis One moon rocket. How excited are you for launch later this year and just excited for, for again, Kennedy's role in deep space exploration? Yeah, it's, it's an incredible honor to be here leading the center mm -hmm. um, for that really, really historic mission coming up. And of course, Ian through us a curveball, and so we had, uh, you know, we made the right decision yes. and went back into uh, uh, the VAB. Um, but the energy uh, around the center and even across the whole space case is still very palpable. Um, looking forward to that launch and when it goes uh, boy it's going to really rock the uh, entire space coast and, and as i said it's and to copy very, that very dragon historic. we saw the same we are with all four eagerly suits looking forward all to that first their mission checks, which is then going to uh, help us the going on to the moon and then on to mars janet thank you so much and we actually just heard a call out there so or the they're completing we are going to the proceed with the count uh, and move into section five uh, for side hatch closure and delay any other troubleshooting steps until we get on orbit how copy Okay, that's great news. Dragon copies, and we are going to continue into section three of 4.100. Sorry, section five of 4.100. Dragon copies, Dragon. Janet, thank you so much. So sorry about that. We did want to take a pause so that people can hear again the operational loops that we're listening into. But thank you so much, and I hope to be watching Artemis One with you soon. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Megan, and go, go Crew Five. Perfect, Janet. Thank you so much. Back to you, Daryl and Bob. Bye bye. All right. Thank you, Megan and Janet. And as we were watching uh, the crew there, we saw their suits inflate. We saw that uh, that pressurization happen, and then you heard a report out. And uh, if you could just recap that for me, Bob. Yeah, I, I think the team saw similar indications, but uh, it was uh, four good leak checks with similar performance from all three suits, uh, that, or all four suits that they saw during that first leak check that they accomplished today inside the capsule. So they're going to continue to, uh, with the launch count, and any further troubleshooting will be delayed until they're on orbit. So we're ready to continue with the count. And so up next, you can see there is the closure of the hatch. And the closeout team will begin performing that. There they are. The hatch is above the entryway into Dragon. They'll remove the environmental conditioning hoses. They'll document that seal and put that on their mobile pads and move through 
the process? You know, I always think of things like hatch closure as uh, closing the door and it's done in an instant. But uh, closure of the hatch on a spacecraft is done very carefully with a lot of meticulous steps to ensure that that environmental seal is uh, just pristine and, and they are going to get a good seal when they close it up. You had the tech go over it and in back into the spacecraft, so double check on that. They also document the seal. You'll see one of the techs take pictures all the way around the seal. And we could think some about that hatch being closed and then it'll be reopened when they come back at the end of their mission after splashdown um, and when the when the vehicle's brought on board the ship. So it's going to stay closed for a long time if, after they get it closed for the spacecraft launch. That's a great point. So it needs to be closed well. Dragon, closeout team is taking final steps in preparation for side hatch closure. Stand by for transition to pad hatch closed. Ensure that all items are secure from now through launch. And what is that, Bob? It's just a protective piece of... Dragon copy. All to make sure no fog or anything secure. falls down we'll into that area. Pad hatch Good words. So I'm... Some protective equipment for the SEAL there right. on, the, on the spacecraft. All right, very good. We'll keep watching the action and tracking the progress as we head down towards launch. T-minus one hour and 50 minutes until liftoff of Crew-5. Want to head on out to Megan Cruz, who is with our NASA Administrator, Bill Nelson. Yeah, it's our honor to have you here, uh, Administrator. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to talk to you about how we've had this continued presence on the ISS for 22 years. What do you think of that legacy? Isn't it something? Yeah. Uh, think of the 3,000 investigations that we have done, scientific uh, uh, things, and, and the innumerable things that we've actually discovered doing yes. all of this science on the International Space Station. Of course, it helps us train our astronauts as uh, we get ready to go fly to the moon, and then we're going to go to Mars. Yeah, it's such a unique and, and awesome platform. So yeah, the fact that we can have this continued presence is so so great. Um, and you know, Crew-5 is this first mission to resume integrated uh, crew flights to the space station with uh, Roscosmos. Integrated crews have always been the norm on the space station, right? That's right, because we built the space station together now with uh, 15 nations, uh, particularly uh, with the Russians. There's a Russian segment on the station. Uh, they provide the propulsion. We, the U.S., provides the electricity. So for the safety of all the crew, as well as the operation of the station, we need both there. Now, particularly with regard to safety, uh, if there were a problem, for example, with one of our uh, ability to get to Earth, say we had a medical emergency and had to get somebody to Earth, you need that integrated crew so we can still operate both parts of the space station. So safety is a big reason for us. Yeah. And, you know, we are launching uh, today with the help of, of SpaceX. What do you think about uh, the fact that we've had such a wonderful uh, cadence with SpaceX these last two years with the, with the commercial crew program? Well, SpaceX has been excellent to work with, and the proof's in the pudding. Uh, as a matter of fact, what's happening at the Cape is just unbelievable. Last night there was an Atlas launch. Today we're launching crew to the station. Uh, tomorrow, they're going to launch uh, two communication satellites, mm -hmm. all within the span of three days. Yeah. Uh, so it's incredible. But, but SpaceX has really been inventive, creative. Uh, they've been a good partner for NASA. And it, it shows that this commercial public-private partnership is actually working. Yeah. And now as we're under two minutes uh, to launch of, of Crew-5, what do you have to say to the crew? Any message for them? Well, not only uh, go Dragon, uh, go NASA, but Godspeed. <laughs> and two hours to launch. I misspoke. I'm too excited. <laughs> you, you are. <laughs> Administrator, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here again. Thanks. And we'll uh, check it back in with our partners at JSC now.
Thanks, Megan. And when Crew 5 arrives at the space station tomorrow evening, they'll officially become Expedition 68 flight engineers. Once on board, they'll do something known as a direct handover, basically saying that Crew 4 and Crew 5 will be on board the station together until Crew 4 comes home next week. Crew 4 will be able to give Crew 5 an orientation and show them the ropes, which will be particularly helpful for first-time space flyers Nicole Mann, Josh Cassida, and Anna Kikina. A direct handover also helps ensure continuous U.S. presence on the space station, a record we've held almost 22 years. The space station is an orbiting laboratory, and they will jump right into research and investigations. Now I'll toss it over to Daryl at the Kennedy Space Center with a little bit more of that science. Daryl? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Shaniqua. And we continue to monitor the uh, closure of the hatch on the Crew Dragon. You see the closeout team there. I want to take a closer look now at some of the life-changing science the astronauts are performing aboard the International Space Station. The International Space Station is a state-of-the-art microgravity laboratory that is unlocking discoveries not possible on Earth and helping us push farther into deep space. Every single day we are answering big questions about Earth and about space, about where we came from and about where we're going. But the other thing that we're doing is we're learning more questions to ask. Microgravity turns almost everything we know upside down. Liquids behave completely differently. Fire burns in new ways. Biological systems reveal surprises. There's a few things that have made me gasp out loud up on board space station watching heart cells actually beat has been a pretty big one. We're studying ways to grow food in microgravity. I gotta tell you, these, uh, these are pretty amazing. We're learning how human bodies react to life in space and how to keep crew members safe and strong on long duration exploration missions. Deadlifts are awesome on Earth. They're also awesome in zero gravity. We're testing technologies that will be critical to our return to the moon and great leap to Mars. Our research has contributed to medical and social benefits on our home planet, allowing us to find new ways to combat disease back on Earth and develop technologies to deliver clean water to remote communities in need. The spectacular vantage point of more than 200 miles above our planet supports our monitoring of Earth's climate, natural disasters, and plant life. The orbital perspective that we have here on the ISS is just absolutely amazing. Earth is gorgeous. The growing new space economy, so vital to our continued progress in space, is flourishing in low Earth orbit. We're inspiring future generations from a platform that is one of the largest international collaborations of our time. We're doing science at 17,500 miles per hour. Come along for the ride. So much about what these missions are about is the science. And even though, Bob, you were telling me, test flight, um, that of course it was historic at the time, that reestablishing America's presence to launch from American soil, get to the space station. You didn't have a lot of science on your flight, but when you got up there, there was a lot of science to do, right? Even a backlog. Absolutely, Daryl. You know, for my guest, for my launch guest, even though it was a test flight that we were headed to the space station to check out a new vehicle, my T-shirt said, because science. <laughs> and that was the reason that we were going. And uh, I was proud to be a part of the, uh, when I arrived at space station, of the science that we were able to accomplish. As, as you mentioned, there was a bit of a backlog. We had a single U.S. crew member, and uh, Doug and I were put into service right away, <laughs> trying to support uh, getting the science program back up and running and, and back at full speed. Working hard on that science, just like our next guest who is joining us now. We have Mike Roberts here with us. He is the chief scientist for the ISS National Laboratory. Mike, thank you so much uh, for being here with us today. It's a beautiful day to launch and a good day to talk about some of the science that's on board. you got currently, as I understand, 235 investigations on board. 76 of them are new, and you got a little bit of them flying right on this rocket here behind us. Yeah, it certainly is a beautiful day here today, and we look forward to getting the science off the ground. As Bob indicated, it's a very busy time up in orbit for the crew because they are very busy not only 
maintaining the science portfolio of, of NASA so that we can continue to live and operate in space. They're also conducting science in space that benefits, benefits us here directly on Earth, and that's an important part of why the ISS National Laboratory exists. What is some of the science that Crew-5 is working on? So as the crew goes up today and, and uh, docks the station, they're going to be engaged in a lot of research that addresses medical needs here on Earth. We have partnerships with the National Institutes of Health through the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, which is doing some very important research that leverages the access to persistent microgravity dead environment. As uh, Bob, I'm sure, experienced in the microgravity environment, your body's physiology adapts to that environment in different ways, and in some cases, those effects of microgravity on the body mimic the onset and progression of disease and aging here on Earth. Mm. So the National Institutes of Health is taking advantage of that by sending small cells in tiny bioreactors up to space to understand how those individual systems respond to that environment so that we can design more effective therapeutics for use here on Earth. We also have experiments launching on Crew-5 going up with the crew today that are going to explore the effects of microgravity on the gut microbiome. Uh, a company is uh, at, involved with Los Alamos National Laboratory, so it's another collaboration between ISS National Lab, Los Alamos National Lab, and its partners to better understand how microgravity impacts the gut microbiome and the human body. Microgravity certainly an impact on astronauts the entire time they're out there. And we've been studying this for so long, and it's great to see a study that's uh, looking at uh, those internal functions of the gut. Uh, it would be fascinating to see what comes of that. Um, as we truck along here, I, I understand that we now have science on board the actual Crew-5 vehicle. That's not something that's always been capable of uh, happening, right? We do. Uh, for ISS National Lab and all of the sponsors, the International Space Station, the availability of extra crew members going up on commercial crew has been a significant advantage. We've doubled the amount of time that's available for crew to conduct science. But also, we have the ability to utilize the crew vehicles to get some science up there that can fit within the confines that's not occupied by the crew. So while most of our science and supplies still go up on the commercial resupply vehicles, we're also able to utilize the vehicles themselves that are taking the crew up to get some expedited science up and get it back. And we're looking at some video now of Lamb Division. You can tell me a little bit about that. Another very important uh, uh, development in space is the utilization of space and access for commercial companies. So Lamb Division is a small startup biotechnology company that is pioneering the use of bacterial rhodopsin, a protein from bacteria that can be used to manufacture artificial retinas. Mm. So Lamb Division is utilizing the absence of microgravity to improve their ability to manufacture these artificial retinas in space. These artificial retinas, when they're approved for use by the FDA, will enable Lamb Division to offer the availability to recover from retinitis pigmentosa and macular degeneration here on Earth. Currently, there are no effective therapies for that that recover full sight or full vision. How about that? This technology offers that advantage. Offering a lot of hope uh, for people who suffer from those diseases, and so it'll be exciting to see what kind of results come from that experiment. It is, and Lamb Division's had the opportunity through ISS National Lab and, and NASA to operate four different experiments in space. So this new era of easy access to space for supportive science that benefits here on Earth is really turning into to some new great dividends for people on Earth. Mike Roberts, Chief Scientist for the ISS National Laboratory, thanks for being here and sharing your knowledge about the science on board, the ISS. Thanks, Daryl. All right, as we continue to watch the operation and our team check through the milestones here, we will toss it back out to Houston. Actually, we're going to throw it to California and Hawthorne, where Sandra and Jesse are standing by. Thanks, Daryl. Earlier, we did talk about the progress that both NASA and SpaceX have made in human spaceflight since we first started flying Dragon regularly over 10 years ago. So to support our increasing number of human spaceflight missions, your spacesuit team has been busy at work, Jesse. <laughs> yes, we have. You might be surprised to know that the completion of the Crew-5 suits marks SpaceX's 50th completed IVA or intravehicular activity suit, including 
development training and qualification suits. 30 of those suits were created for flight. This number is inclusive of the suits that the Crew-5 astronauts are wearing today. 17 of the 50 were built and used for development and training. One was used to get our suit qualified for space, and we produced suits to support the passengers for a couple demonstration missions as well. You may recall Starman and Ripley. Starman flew on our first Falcon Heavy flight in 2018 and is still flying around out in space. And Ripley was the anthropomorphic test device that flew on Demo 1 to help us collect lots of data before flying Bob and Doug. And as a reminder, this spacesuit that you've seen the crew wearing throughout operations today is an intravehicular activity suit designed for use inside Dragon. Its primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin depressurization. Now, when the astronauts move onto the International Space Station following docking, the spacesuits will stay on board Dragon. The astronauts will then use NASA's extravehicular activity or EVA suit when outside of the International Space Station performing spacewalks. The suit teams work tirelessly to make sure all of our astronauts have a positive experience while wearing our spacesuits and ensures the highest level of safety. Now, similar to how we innovate and further develop our launch vehicles with each tester mission, our spacesuits have continued to evolve since NASA astronauts Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley first donned them for Demo 2. Some improvements include the patterning process for better fit. Patterns are the individual pieces of fabric that go together to create the suit. Our process involves taking measurements, generating patterns based on those measurements for each layer of the suit, and then performing fit checks where we put together non-flight quick versions of the different layers of the suit to make sure that they fit correctly before making the flight suit. And we've also continued custom patterns for each crew member and have made significant reliability upgrades in the spacesuits. And while the suit is a single piece, which means the helmet, gloves, and boots all remain attached as one piece, with us today is a SpaceX helmet lent to us by the spacesuit team, and you can see it here on the table right now. That's right, Sandra. This helmet is made from 3D printed nylon and has a visor that pivots open. And Dragon SpaceX for side hatch leak checks. Go for okay, Josh, uh, we identified a uh, potential piece of FOD on the side hatch seal when we were inspecting everything, so the closeout team is proceeding to open the hatch to address that before closing and re-performing the leak check. For big picture awareness, we still have approximately uh, 12 minutes remaining in the margin for this timer to perform this action, so we'll, we'll be able to run through everything without uh, issue here. Okay, Dragon Copies will be opened up the side hatch and uh, taking a look at the pod. We've got 12 minutes of margin. Appreciate the heads up. Good read back. So we just got an update. We were closing the hatch. It sounds like they do need to do another inspection, reopen the hatch, reinspect uh, the hatch lining to make sure that there's no FOD caught in there, and then perform the procedure to reclose the hatch one more time. Uh, it sounds like we do have some margin, um, 12 minutes of margin, so we are still on track for liftoff today. Uh, but as we were mentioning, the helmet is made from 3D printed nylon and has a vi visor that pivots open. It's also equipped with a microphone, which is embedded into the helmet, which allows the crew to communicate with the mission operators while suited and seated in Dragon. That's right. And those communication systems that you were talking about, you can see um, inside. They're not inside this helmet because it's not going to be used throughout the mission. Um, but the crew does have the ability to hear via the helmet. Um, and you can see the slots right there uh, for, for that capability. Yeah. Um, and so now we're going to check in with Kate while the team is working on the hatch. So, Kate, how's it going over there? Thanks, Jesse. Yeah, it's super cool to see that helmet up close. Uh, now turning our attention back to the progress with the integrated launch teams, uh, we are coming up on T minus one hour and 32 minutes. Uh, as we just heard a couple of moments ago, the closeout team identified uh, a little bit of FOD in that hatch seal. Um, so basically the process is we close the side hatch, we inflate the seal around the hatch uh, to a certain pressure, and then we hold that pressure to see if there 
there's any decay or leak. Um, and if there is, that's an indication that something is in the seal, and that's what occurred today. So the team is in the process of reopening the hatch. They'll clean the seal out, close it, and inflate the seal and re-perform that leak check. Uh, so normal, as we heard mentioned, we do have 12 minutes of margin in the launch countdown, as I've mentioned before. The countdown is to make sure that everybody is, uh, all the integrated launch teams are aligned uh, and we do build margin in in order to make sure that uh, we can deal with things like this as they come up. Similar to whenever uh, pilot Josh, Josh Cassida had um, a little bit of decay, or excuse me, not decay, a lower pressure value red on his suit, so we rechecked the uh, the suit pressure there as well. So working through those, uh, no issues. We're still tracking for an on, uh, for launch today. Um, and as you can see, the crew seated there comfortably in the capsule. It looks like Anna might be taking a little uh, pre-launch nap. Uh, I don't know if I personally would be able to pull that off, so I really admire the calmness that she's <laughs> demonstrating today. Um, so once that hatch is closed back up and we successfully uh, leak check on that, uh, we should be good to go. Uh, we see some movement there. She's not napping. <laughs> uh, as for the launch engineers, they are located in firing room four in the NASA Launch Control Center at Kennedy Space Center. They have a view uh, through their large windows of pad 39A, which is located just five kilometers east of them. Uh, currently, the Falcon 9 team is loading helium and nitrogen gas into storage bottles on the launch vehicle. You see on your screen firing room four there now. Uh, RF checkouts are now also complete and the final review of vehicle testing um, performed earlier today is underway. So um, the SpaceX chief engineer, uh, who for this mission is Dan Alex, uh, he will check in with the team at T minus 80 minutes to verify that we are good to continue with the countdown. Now, the next major activity, uh, we will flow a small amount of fuel into the first stage to prime those Merlin 1D engines for ignition. Uh, the team is also monitoring fuel and liquid oxygen loading preparations, ensuring that the propellants in the ground takes are correctly chilled to uh, prior loading prior to loading them onto Falcon 9. Uh, propellant load will begin at T minus 35 minutes. Uh, now at just under T minus one hour and 30 minutes ourselves, the weather continues to be green. As you can see, beautiful clear day at pad 39A, but we are of course monitoring weather uh, at downrange as well, and that continues to look good. And the range remains green and ready to support. So uh, all that being said, we are on track to launch in under an hour and a half from now, uh, and we are certainly getting excited here in Hawthorne. Uh, with that, let's turn it back over to Daryl and Bob at Kennedy Space Center. How's it going over there, guys? All right, thank you very much, Kate. And we continue to monitor the work that the closeout team is doing right there, uh, checking, rechecking uh, the seal to Dragon between the hatch and the spacecraft, and there you can see the techs making that inspection now, taking a light around it. They had the hatch closed, but reopened it after doing the side hatch leak check. And Bob, it was interesting, we were talking about this uh, just briefly before uh, Kate threw to us, and there's a way they can check that seal to see if there's any FOD in it. And I thought it was interesting how they do that. Well, yes, uh, Daryl. I Kate gave a great explanation of uh, that process uh, just a couple minutes ago. But what they do is they, they need to find a way, of course, uh, before you get into space to make sure that the integrity of that seal is good. And so what they do is they're able to inflate a small portion, a, a small volume, to ensure that they do have a good pressurization on the sides of that seal. And if they do have a leak or, or some indication that things aren't exactly right, you know, the most likely culprit is some sort of foreign object that's kind of captured in that sealing surface. And so the team goes back in, cleans that area out, and uh, then we'll kind of reaccomplish that leak check to make sure that it's good before the crew gets into the vacuum of space with the spacecraft. And you can see they've wrapped up that process of inspecting, cleaning, and documenting the seal. And now they've reclosed the side hatch to Crew Dragon with our Crew 5 astronauts inside, and they'll start sealing up the hatch now. We'll keep monitoring the action and let you know what's going on. And Dragon, the team's for got a quick update, the closeout team was able to open the side hatch and remove the uh, hair that they identified as FOD. They've closed the side, the side hatch and are stepping into their leak checks right now. We are right on schedule for launch today. 
exciting copies. That's great news, and we're standing by for that loop check. Thanks. Okay, well, there you heard confirmation that they found what it was. And real quick, Bob, before we throw it to an interview, a hair was identified. It's fascinating to me that something as small as hair can actually compromise a seal. Yes, it's, uh, it's really important that that area is super pristine. And, and like we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, that hatch is going to be closed for six months as they make their way into orbit and then uh, won't get open until they come back and are on board the and recovery again, ship. And ground is going to be commencing a health check for launch escape system a second time. Expect a momentary flight computer state change, followed by that transition back to pad hatch closed. Dragon copies. We'll touch it again prior to going back to pad hatch closed. Good read back. We will keep monitoring the action here outside the Dragon spacecraft. You heard the launch escape system checks are coming up momentarily as they continue to secure the side hatch. In the meantime, let's go out to Megan Cruz, who has a very special guest, Lieutenant General Thomas Stafford, one of the 24 astronauts we sent to the moon. Megan. Yes, Daryl, I'm very excited to have uh, the Lieutenant General here with me today. Uh, I mean, it's just, I'm so honored to be sitting next to you here. I wanted to ask you, is this your first crewed launch that you've seen? Oh, no, no, Megan. Uh, I was here before when we had uh, commercial launch number two. So always just love to see a launch. Absolutely. Having done four missions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, does being here, does it make you kind of reminisce on, on those four missions you've had? You know, you're part of the Gemini and, and Apollo programs, and we actually have some, some pictures of you from those missions that we'd love to share with everyone. Can you talk us through what this oh, picture yeah. is? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Here we are right after we've landed on Gemini 9. That was in June 6, 1966. There's Gene Cernan, my pilot. He's the first one to walk in space completely around the world. We did three different rendezvous on that. And we also touched down closer than any Gemini or Apollo. Wow. So and then we have another picture, actually. This one's from Apollo 10, right? And that's you, the second astronaut um, farthest from the uh, transport van, right? Right. So the, uh, you know, that was a great mission. It was the first uh, lunar module to the moon. And I did the first... We were too heavy to land, or we might have had a chance to be the first ones to land on the moon. But we were too heavy to land, but we went out to nine miles above the lunar surface, photo map, radar map, and visually map, picked out an ellipse and had three potential landing sites. He did that twice and came up and did the first rendezvous around the moon. Yeah. And then on the way back set the all-time world speed record. At this this picture is a little blurry, but it's honestly my favorite of the three pictures. Can you tell us what's happening here? You guys are on your way to the moon here, right? We're on our way to the moon. We're walking slow to, walking slow to the transfer van. <laughs> but then on the way back, we're doing, uh, well, 24,791 miles an hour, or th Mach 36 miles per second, yeah. making seven miles a second. Wow, wow. So, that record still stands. Wow. You know, we're talking about the Apollo 10 mission and, 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 and the work that you guys were able to, to establish to get us where we are today with our Artemis 1 moon rocket right behind us in the Vehicle Assembly Building. Are you looking forward to the Artemis 1 launch later this year? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I've worked on helping getting that through Congress back in 2010. That's the authorization that authorized it. So I'm... Um, yeah, I've had 12 years of work on that one. Yes. Lieutenant General, thank you so much for being here, and I hope you enjoy the Crew 5 launch today. Oh, it's great to be here. The weather's good, and I'm sure you're going to have a great launch, man. Thank you so much. All right, Darren, we'll send it back to you. Wow, well, that was fantastic to hear from the Ground Lieutenant segment, General. Loud and clear. Stand by from ComCheck by Launch Control. Dragon, Launch Control on Countdown 1, ComCheck. Launch control, Dragon, loud and clear. Launch control, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the chief engineer. We're getting comm check right CE now. Dragon, CE on countdown one, comm check. Listening in. CE, Dragon, loud and clear. CE, loud and clear also. This completes the Falcon 9 responsible engineer comm checks. There will be a series of these checks.
establishing a number of communication paths to the crew from launch control. Want to just uh, update you really quick. We got a good side hatch leak check. Again, a good side hatch leak check after some FOD was found that compromised it following the first closure. Teams went back in, opened the hatch, cleaned off the seal, shut the hatch back, rechecked the seal, and we are good to go. Again, good side leak, side hatch leak check, and we're moving forward now with the comm checks. The SpaceX team working quickly. They had 12 minutes of margin. They whittled that down to about three or four minutes. And so great job by them. Tackling that issue that can pop up as you're preparing to launch a spacecraft to the International Space Station. There's the Falcon 9 rocket on the pad with the Dragon spacecraft atop. We've got a beautiful day. Nice skies above. Take a little moment to listen to a special message now from somebody who's familiar to both of us, more him than me. Our previous co-host from the last crew mission, Crew 4, and the launch broadcast. A very special person to all of us here. Let's take a listen. Hello, husband. It looks like you're doing a great job with the launch commentary. Keep up the great work. It seems like all those tips that I gave you are paying off. Um, a couple of things I forgot to mention, though. You should probably share some of your snacks with Daryl because he does get a little hangry if he doesn't get enough to eat. And also, it's important as the co-host to make sure you laugh and smile at all of his jokes. It makes him feel really good. Um, actually, there's a couple other people in the family that want to say hello to you as well. Just give me, just give me one second. Do a good job, Daddy, or else I will find new ways to motivate you. In all seriousness, though, Nicole and Josh and Koichi and Anna, I want to wish you well on your journey. You guys have worked so hard to get here. You're going to be absolutely outstanding on the International Space Station. I cannot wait to see you up there. We're going to be cheering you on from down here. Have a blast, and we'll see you when you get home. What a beautiful message. She's so good with the camera and giving the message. Thank you so much to Megan MacArthur for saying that. By the way, I've taken care of myself. I've got my food here. But uh, it's so good to see her and, and uh, you're a little touched by her message. No, it was absolutely great to see my wife, of course, our, our dog Shadow, who arrived in our family after we uh, returned from the Demo 2 mission. You know, my son requested Dragon approval. SpaceX, we just had a good side hatch leak check. My son requested a, approval to have a dog when uh, the mission was accomplished, and so that was pretty cool to have the dog included. And, of course, uh, Darth Vader making a guest <laughs> appearance, and not something that I expected, but uh, that costume has a little bit of history. We surprised Megan uh, during the mission on board the, her time on Space Station with that costume, and uh, surprisingly, she found one on board Space Station to surprise us right back. Oh, how about that? And... Uh, He's using the dark side of the forest at the moment. He's going to motivate <laughs> an answer out of you. He may have heard that line uh, from both his mother and myself uh, as we try to work through elementary school. Well, a nice moment there. Thank you, Megan, for uh, doing that. And uh, I'll make sure Bob laughs at my jokes. Or other, maybe I need to just tell better jokes. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> hey, we want to catch you up on the action. We did have um, some FOD that was found in the seal. Uh, in the side hatch, and that was removed. The SpaceX team working quickly uh, to get that removed and cleared. They resealed the hatch and uh, repressurized it, and we have a confirmation just heard minutes ago of a good side leak hatch uh, check. And so uh, the team is preferring. The team is uh, moving forward. Well, the beautiful shot of there of uh, Dragon as we look out over the Atlantic. We've got some social media questions, and we asked you to submit them. Uh, we've had a little action that we've been dealing with this morning, so haven't been able to do a whole lot of questions, but we're going to start getting to them now. And at Con asks, what kind of personal items can the crew take with them to the International Space Station? 
No, Dale, it's a great question and one that we get asked often. Uh, what kind of personal items can the crew take with them? Um, usually it's something small is probably the best answer to that question. But they're items that are personal mementos of, of family members or otherwise. Uh, you saw my son earlier in the Darth Vader costume. <laughs> um, as you can tell, Star Wars has a special place in our family. And so we were able to glue together a small Lego ship and have my wife take that into space. Oh. Uh, I took one uh, during, during my mission as well so that we would have something that he could connect with that was part of our family, something to talk about, you know, during our, our, our family conferences. Uh, there, are, there are many small items with individuals that you want to make a personal connections with that, that typically the, the crew will take with them. They also may take something that's special to them that allows them to either remember Earth or uh, take advantage of a hobby that they have, whether it's a guitar or uh, other musical instrument, uh, small items like that. It's, it must be nice to have that connection back to Earth and your family uh, because of, uh, you know, you're up there in space, and especially now with these long-duration space missions lasting six months. And it's interesting, you mentioned the small effects. Uh, Commander Nicole Mann um, taking her wedding rings, but also some surprise special gifts for her family and a dream catcher that her mother made for her when she was a child. That's aboard uh, her personal effects, which you get about 3.3 pounds of personal effects, as you mentioned. Uh, so a nice cultural uh, memento, part of her heritage as a Native American, the first Native American woman to go to space. Let's check uh, back now with California and toss it out to Hawthorne with Sandra and Jesse. Ladies. Thanks, Daryl. We are just one hour and a little over 15 minutes from launch, and it is getting more and more exciting as we get to that T-0. The crew has already ingressed the Dragon vehicle. They were helped out by our closeout team. Umbilicals were attached uh, to their suit, which provides breathing air and comms to Dragon. Suit leak checks were completed, as well as comms checks completed with the core and the launch director. And after those suit leak checks, the closeout team was able to close and seal the hatch. We just got confirmation that we did have a good leak check uh, during the first round of closing the hatch. We, they did find a piece of FOD. It was a piece of hair. We were able to open it back up, remove the FOD, and close the hatch, and then completed that uh, seal check. Um, and now the closeout team is just wrapping up. And once they wrap up uh, in that white room, they will depart the white room. And those final weather checks will be coming up soon, uh, which will be necessary before a final go, no go. And there you can see the closeout team there on your screen. Again, just wrapping up the final procedures for hatch closure there. So let's check back in with Houston for a status on the team supporting the space station on their readiness for launch. Shaniqua, how's it going? Thanks, Jesse. The team here in Mission Control Houston has polled that they are go for the launch. The International Space Station and its onboard crew are ready for Crew 5 astronauts to lift off. When Flight Director Greg Whitney polled his team, he was asking the flight controllers who work on all the different systems on board the space station if their focus areas were online and working properly. This includes life support systems, proper communication links, computers that allow us to command the station on board and their subsystems, and our ability to maneuver the space station are fully functional. The crew in orbit is awake and just finished their midday meals. They will start crew arrival preparations shortly, making sure they are ready to receive the new crew tomorrow. Mission Control Houston will continue monitoring the mission as we check off milestones for today's flight. In the meantime, I'll send it back over to Hawthorne. The International Space Station Flight Control Room is ready for launch. Sandra? Thank you. 
Thanks, Janiqua. That's great news. And Walt Crew 5 is launching today. Just a few months ago, we were launching another crew to the International Space Station. That is, of course, Crew 4, who launched in April. The Crew 4 astronauts currently on board the International Space Station have spent nearly six months conducting scientific research in areas such as material science, health technologies, and plant science to prepare for human exploration beyond low Earth orbit and to benefit life on Earth. Such research also lays the groundwork for future exploration of the Moon and Mars, starting with the agency's Artemis missions. Dr. Chow Ling Rin was born in Tepe, Taiwan, but spent most of his childhood overseas in England. He was an instructor and jump master with the U.S. Air Force Academy and also has a doctorate in medicine and served as a NASA flight surgeon. After he was chosen as an astronaut, Ling Rin flew on Soyuz and spent 141 days in space during Expedition 44 and 45. He has a wife and three children and is the commander of Dragon Freedom. And up next is fellow airman Bob Hines. He was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and has a wife and three daughters. He has a Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering and served 21 years in the U.S. Air Force as a test pilot and as a fighter pilot in the F-15E. He came to NASA as a research pilot where he flew the science, where he flew science missions in the WB-57. He's the pilot for NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 mission, which has been his first space flight. Now there's a couple mission specialists on board Crew-4, one of which is Jessica Watkins, who considers Lafayette, Colorado her hometown. A talented rugby player in college, her team won the national championship in 2008. Watkins was a postdoctoral fellow in the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences at the California Institute of Technology. She completed several internships with NASA, including one testing system designs for the Mars Perseverance mission at JPL. She became an astronaut in 2017, and just like Bob, Crew 4 was her first flight to space. And the second mission specialist is Samantha Cristoforetti. She was born in Milan, Italy, but now lives in Cologne, Germany, with her partner and two children. In 2006, she earned her fighter pilot wings and flew the AMX attack fighter pilot fighter at a base in Italy. In 2013, Cristoforetti launched into space aboard a Soyuz for a long-duration spaceflight to the International Space Station. And several years later, she was awarded the Knight Grand and cross of the Order of Merit from the President of Italy. Crew 4 was her second space flight. This four-person crew is currently preparing for Crew 5's arrival and also their return back to Earth just days from now. And while Crew 4 was on board, they received a visit from another Dragon. SpaceX's 25th resupply mission to the International Space Station launched on July 14th, carrying over 5,800 pounds of science, research, hardware, and other crew supplies to the orbiting laboratory. Dragon stayed on station for a little over a month before being packed with critical research and hardware to be analyzed after a safe splashdown off the coast of Florida on August 20th. Now let's head over to Daryl at Kennedy Space Center. Daryl, how are you guys doing over there? Well, thank you, Jesse and Sandra. Well, we're having a beautiful day here at the Kennedy Space Center. You can see behind us, we're at the Launch Complex 39, where media are gathering, getting ready to count down the final hour as we get ready to watch Crew-5 launch into space. It is a big day. And especially here at the Kennedy Space Center, where we have just been cranking out the launches, Bob, Three launches in three days from three different pads. We had uh, the Atlas V going off from 40 yesterday. We've got Crew 5, of course, from Launch Complex 39A today. And then tomorrow, SpaceX launching from their other launch pad, Pad 41. Topping. Outstanding uh, to see all that action down here at the Kennedy Space Center. And again, it's a beautiful day. I'm looking forward to seeing the Crew 5 uh, folks uh, get into orbit. Indeed, and liftoff time is still holding for noon Eastern time, 56 seconds after noon, if you want to be right on the second. We're also tracking no issues at the moment with Falcon 9 or Dragon. We did have an additional suit leak check that we performed, as well as a spacecraft leak check. Those are good to go. Dragon now good to go. The range is green. 
And of course, the weather is doing fabulous here at the Kennedy Space Center. Downrange, they're watching some winds in the, uh, the abort uh, corridor, but they're looking good right now. And so the crew of Crew 5, talking about Commander Nicole Mann, Pilot Josh Cassida, and Mission Specialist Koichi Wakata and Nana Kikina, well, they donned their spacesuits in the historic crew quarters suit-up room this morning. They woke up around 4.30 a.m., donned those suits around 7 a.m. They walked out of the crew quarters building as every NASA astronaut has done since Apollo 7. And then they were transported to the pad where they climbed inside the SpaceX Dragon Endurance for its second flight. Now we are seeing them live while they await liftoff. Bob, you live this with your fellow astronaut, Doug Hurley. What is the crew doing right now at this moment? You know, Daryl, it's a, it's a good question at this point. I think you can see on the camera that what the crew is really focused on right now is uh, relaxing. You know, they've had a hectic morning, if you will, one that's very well scripted, one that's very well controlled, but one that causes them to need to be on schedule through all the individual milestones leading up to launch. That part's behind them now, and they're taking a chance to relax and catch their breath uh, before the tanking operations begin here in uh, just a few minutes. Indeed, tanking coming up as well as the launch escape system checkout and the arming that will follow. The rocket is on the pad, ready to go. And over the next hour, we will conduct a series of polls to get ready for launch. The crew will also, as I mentioned, will be arming that launch escape system, and then the fueling of Falcon 9 will begin. Let's talk a little bit about the details of today's flight. Launch, of course, as we mentioned, set for a, just a few seconds after noon, a little more than an hour from now. And then Crew-5 astronauts will race towards space, reaching orbit in about 12 minutes. That's followed by a roughly 29-hour flight to dock with the International Space Station, one of the longer transit times to the ISS. And then that docking will happen at 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. And, of course, we'll have coverage of that. A quick history of NASA's commercial crew program. It all began with the first successful and historic test flight Dragon of SpaceX. Crew Dragon. The closeout team has departed the crew arm, and with that, ground is going to cycle the orbit tank isolation valve to equalize low flow pressure. Dragon test. All right, they're cycling the valve there, and as well, closeout team is now departing. That location that you see, 39A, they'll be uh, making their way off the pad, and that will lead us into getting ready to fuel the rocket. Of course, I was talking about the historic test flight for my uh, partner here and co-host, Bob Benkin, his crewmate, Doug Hurley. Together, they flew the mission that was called Demo 2. And uh, after Bob and Doug returned, of course, NASA was certified uh, with SpaceX to fly astronauts regularly to and from the International Space Station. And, of course, that led to the regular rotational missions that we see today, the fifth rotational mission to the International Space Station. Let's check in now with Kate Tice in California. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, quick status update for those that have recently tuned in. We've had a smooth countdown so far today. That you can see there on your screen are four Crew-5 astronauts have ingressed. They are in their seats. Their five-point safety harness is buckled in, and uh, they are looking relaxed and ready to go. Uh, they ingressed about an hour and 45 minutes ago, um, and the teams have completed the required comm checks, the suit leak checks, the side hatch closure, and its associated leak check. We did have to redo that leak check as a piece of FOD uh, was found in the seals. So we opened the hatch back up, uh, cleared out the seal, cleaned it, and then uh, closed the hatch again and reperformed that leak check, and we got 
good lead check there. Um, and we heard just moments ago that the closeout team is beginning to depart the pad. Uh, and at that point in time, it'll just be the crew five astronauts left on the pad once the closeout team departs the BDA. Uh, at this point in time, I'm happy to report that the SpaceX team is working no issues, uh, and the pace is certainly beginning to pick up. As for Falcon 9, our two-stage reusable rocket, final propulsion checkouts of the first and second stages, and the engine began a few minutes ago in preparation for propellant loading. Uh, this involves testing and cycling valves and engine pneumatics pressurization. At T40, at T minus 45 minutes, the team will report their readiness for prop load with a final electronic go no go poll. Again, that prop load will begin at T minus 35 minutes. Uh, as for Dragon, before we can start loading propellant on Falcon 9, we still have a few Dragon-related tasks to perform. Uh, first, we need to retract the crew access arm away from the Dragon capsule. We can see it there, uh, currently connecting the crew tower to the capsule. Uh, we will need to retract that access arm away to its launch position. Uh, that will happen between T minus 44 and 42 minutes, uh, so shortly coming up. That will be the that that will be the last physical change to the crew tower. Um, with the access arm out of the way, the launch escape system will then be armed. Once those two events are complete, Dragon will be ready for uh, Falcon propellant loading. Uh, we did hear earlier uh, in one of the pre-launch briefs that once the launch escape system is armed, we will not have the ability to recycle. Uh, so we are basically locked in for launch today as soon as we have that launch system um, uh, armed. As for weather, we will also ver verify with the launch weather officer uh, that all the weather meets all of the associated constraints, including items such as wind speed, lightning, and precipitation. Um, <laughs> looks like with those beautiful blue sky behind Falcon and barely any clouds. Uh, we don't think rain is going to be an issue, nor lightning. Uh, now, we do expect uh, acceptable weather conditions for launch, both at surface level and upper altitudes. As I mentioned earlier, we have been watching those downrange winds, and they continue to trend favorably. So everything green there. As for the range, currently clear for launch from historic launch pad 39A, the worldwide network of ground stations and the tracking and data relay satellites, or TDRS as you hear us refer, uh, refer to it as, um, those are ready to support Dragon as it heads into orbit. Today we have an instantaneous launch window at 12 p.m. Eastern, noon on the dot. Uh, once we begin loading propellant, there is no opportunity to change that T0. The timing for Dragon to rendezvous with the International Space Station is incredibly precise down to the very second. So we only get one chance at it today. But at good news, at T minus one hour uh, on the dot and counting, we are go for launch. And we are now less than one hour until liftoff. This day is Dragon, the continuum. You are go for section six. When ready, report go for launch. Dragon copies. We're stepping into the fifth and fourth level 100 preparation for LES Army. Good readback. So again, we are now less than one hour until liftoff, and this day is the continuation of regular crew flights to the space station from U.S. soil. SpaceX's Crew-5 mission will be the company's sixth crewed space flight for NASA, following the crewed test flight Demo-2 and four previous operational crewed missions to the International Space Station. It will also be SpaceX's eighth crewed space flight overall, including the private orbital mission Inspiration-4. Today, our crew is flying on board Dragon Endurance. It will be the second flight for this capsule, and it will be taking a ride on a brand new Falcon 9. Now, it's been a great countdown so far. Weather, as Kate has been updating us with, is still good for T0, so the excitement just continues to pick up here as we get closer to that T0. Dragon in Section 6, Crew 5 is go for launch. Copy that, Nicole. Crew 5 is go for launch. 
And you just heard it yourself. Crew 5 is go for launch. Another exciting milestone. We did start our coverage earlier today with the crew heading to the launch pad. And prior to that, the SpaceX team did help the crew put on their spacesuits and conduct initial checkouts before crew walkout. Crew walkout was where Nicole Mann, Josh Cassida, Koichi Wakata, and Anya Kikina gave final goodbyes with friends and family gathered outside the operations and checkout building before they began that roughly 20-minute ride to pad 39A. And we were able to watch the crew as they boarded their Teslas and headed down the NASA causeway, headed towards the launch pad. And once they arrived at the pad, the crew took a moment to enjoy the view of the vehicle as that they will be taking flight on uh, this afternoon and then headed up the fixed service structure to begin a process known as crew ingress where the astronauts entered the Dragon spacecraft. The SpaceX team then performed a series of checks to ensure the suits, seats, and vehicle interactions were all functioning properly. And a short time ago, a short time ago, the team did close out Dragon's hatch, and the crew is safely inside. So with less than an hour to go until liftoff, things will continue to pick up as we get close to the go, no-go pole to arm the launch escape system and begin propellant loading. The crew pull for readiness was completed at the T minus 60 minute mark, and the Dragon pull for prop load is coming up here at T minus 55 minutes. After that, at T minus 45 minutes, will be an internal mission control Hawthorne pull, and then the launch director's pull for propellant loading. When we get to about T minus 40 minutes, the crew access arm will retract, and the crew will get the call to close their visors and to arm the launch escape system. Now, this is the automated safety system in place that can fire the eight Super Draco thrusters on Dragon to quickly separate the crew from the rocket, either on the pad or during the flight on the ride uphill. And then once we reach about T minus 35 minutes, propellant loading for the Falcon 9 will begin. So we did hear that the crew is go for launch. Great news. So with that, let's send it back to the team in Florida. Megan? Great news, guys. So, yeah, now I'm joined with uh, Brian Onyate, but I'm going to have him say his title because I think I'm going to mess it up. So you say what you are. Sure. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah, my, I'm the Chief of the Utilization and Life Sciences Office here at Kennedy Space Center. Yeah, it was a little long. I was like, I'm going to have him say it. Yep, long title. So I wanted to talk to you about how NASA has been studying plant growth and microgravity for many years now. So tell us about the two experiments that Crew-5 is going to be working on while they're on station. Sure. Uh, we have two uh, experiments going up. One is more of a plant research experiment. Uh, we call it Plant Habitat 03. Mm -hmm. um, it will be going into the the advanced plant habitat and actually uh, that plant experiment is doing a generational study so as you can see uh, that's the advanced plant habitat and those uh, the plant that is growing in there is called Arabidopsis mm -hmm. it's our model plant and uh, basically we're going to grow that and get it all the way to seed and, and the study is basically getting those seeds bringing them back and then reflying those seeds to see what happens. So what's interesting is... And the second picture, right, that we yeah. have, that's how you capture the seeds. Yeah, that's how we capture the seeds. What's interesting about those seeds, um, they're actually the size of pepper. So imagine oh. the pepper that you put on your food. Um, very tiny, very small. So we had to actually develop these capture bags to grab those seeds. Uh, so what we're noticing is, in a previous experiment, um, the DNA of the plant actually changed. And it almost mm. seemed like it was trying to protect it itself from the environment of mm. space, the harsh environment that's up there. Mm -hmm. So what we want to study is, can we actually um, grab those seeds and will those seeds remember that environment? So when we fly the second generation, will they kind of have a leg up? Will they go already kind of pre-programmed to protect themselves? So that way the plants will thrive in space. That's so, interesting. Yeah. Why is that something that you wanted to see? What can we learn from that or use? Yeah, so what we can do is uh, for exploration with NASA, obviously we want to get to the orbiting station around the moon one day or the surface or the transit vehicle or Mars. How can we better prepare the plants that we mm. send or the crops that we send up there so that they actually are ready to go, they'll thrive, and we understand what's happening so that the crew can actually consume something great. So. Always forward thinking here at Always NASA. forward We're thinking. We're great. <laughs> yeah, always forward thinking. Well, let's talk about the second experiment. That one's called Veg05, and we have some props here to yeah. kind of walk people through that, Yeah, right? we do. Yeah, so Veg05, it's actually, um, we're growing dwarf 
tomato plants, okay. um, and we're going to put them in this, uh, what we call here is a plant pillow. Mm -hmm. um, it's, what's interesting, it's actually made out of Kevlar, so oh. exactly what police <laughs> use in their police vests, so I guess they might be bulletproof um, <laughs> plant pillows, but yeah, so these plant pillows, it's just basically how do we hold the soil, how do we put the fertilizer and the seed in there in order for us to... Um, grow the plants. Because they would just fly around on the space they station. They would just fly around on sure. the space station. So we have a little, what we call a quick disconnect here. This is where we apply the water. So once we apply the water in there, uh, we have to keep watering it like here on earth and just let the plants grow and um, let them thrive in space. So mm -hmm. and uh, you mentioned the fertilizer. Yep, the fertilizer and the arcelite. So what you see there on, on the right there is the um, arcelite, which is actually clay chips, right? It's okay. the soil that basically allows the water to be absorbed and allows the plants the roots to kind of grow in there and grab water and nutrients. Um, the second there that you see there is a fertilizer, and it's a slow-release fertilizer. So when we add water into it, it kind of dissolves little by little, and it provides the food that the plants need so that they can grow. Okay. Yeah. So why is this important for us on space, but also here on Earth, to learn about this particular experiment? Sure. Um, both of these experiments are important. One is, um, obviously, for exploration, we want to make sure that the seeds that we send the plants that we grow will thrive, right? So what, how can we make them excel in space, mm -hmm. right? And the second piece um, with FEDRO 5, which we find interesting, is how can we actually give food for the crew to eat on orbit, right? Sure. So healthy, nutritious food. This is actually going to be our second um, flowering plant that we grow in space, which is awesome. Uh, so they'll grow up there. They'll have to pollinate, you know, and the crew members might have to be our space bees. Oh. You know, we don't have bees <laughs> up there to help us pollinate, so sure. they might have to, you know, help with pollination. They'll grow and then hopefully they'll um, get some nutritious fresh food up Great. there. And yeah. the benefit, um, what I find interesting here for Earth is, there's a lot of things that we learn with ISS. ISS is basically a laboratory or another test tool. So we really want to see what data can we gather from growing up there. So when we bring it down to Earth, if we're in a stressful environment or another environment that is challenging, sure. what did we learn up there so we can actually grow better, better crops here on Earth? I so. love hearing about the science, Brian. Thank you so yeah. much for sharing that with no us. No problem, sounds All right. great, thank we'll you. We'll send it back to you guys. Thank you, Megan and Brian. And uh, throughout the show, we've been taking your hashtag Ask NASA questions from social media. We have time for a few more that have been coming in, and we appreciate those questions coming. If you want to submit one, it's hashtag Ask NASA on our streaming channels, NASA Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch. The question is from Aditi on YouTube. He asked Bob Binken, how was the launch experience different on Space Shuttle and Crew Dragon? Was one better than the other? No, it's a great question, Daryl. We often get asked which vehicle is better, uh, which one we love the most. And from my perspective, I love them both. You know, I had a great opportunity to fly and build space station with a space shuttle, but then rotate as a crew member with the Dragon on a modern spacecraft. You know, that was a, a really neat aspect to see something that was kind of built in the 21st century versus something that was built, you know, in, in almost the middle of the 20th century. If you look back at the technology that was on board the shuttle, just super excited to have an opportunity to fly on such a cool modern new ship. And now, next question, at Mike Mangano, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, asked, and this is a, a fitting question for you, Bob, did the NASA astronauts who fly the Dragon capsule help in the design of the capsule? Why, yes, they did, and that was you. <laughs> You know, it's a, it's, it was an interesting experience, I think, for both uh, Doug and I to have the opportunity to not only fly on a new spacecraft, but be a part of shaping it for crews to come forward. And I think as we went through that process, the SpaceX team really learned how to work with us and how to take our inputs and incorporate them into design whenever they could and explain to us when they couldn't, because everything that we wanted, they couldn't necessarily do. But uh, we were able to compromise and come up with good solutions so that uh, years later, maybe in Crew 5's case, you know, they wouldn't be cursing Bob. Bob and Doug's name <laughs> as to what they had agreed to or said was acceptable uh, when the time came. We wanted to have opportunities for them to have choices. We included the opportunity to write on paper, but also to have a tablet, you know, so that crews, as they went forward with their missions, would be able to find the place that, you know, helped them be as successful as they could be. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that there just aren't too many curses associated with uh, <laughs> Bob and Doug. And it's mostly, you know, hey, those guys, uh, they were thinking when they did this. So, And we've had good results so far with... Uh, four launches and the fifth today. Our next question comes from at morearts.com. If the astronaut schedule shifts during docking activities, does their schedule shift later in the day or the next morning? You know, we do know that the, the ISS crew is sleep shifting in order to accommodate this crew. 
it's true, Daryl, that the, the crew actually has to sleep shift to accommodate the schedules of the vehicle traffic that arrives on board the space station. There are even times when the vehicle arrives a few minutes early or a few minutes late, and the crew needs to be ready for that as well. And so uh, the crew does shift their day around to support all the operational activities, not only vehicle traffic and arrivals, but uh, a spacewalk may impact things or other activities that are happening on the ground, for example, might drive a schedule to be specific as well. But the crew's given time to recover after each of those sleep shifts. Very good. And for those watching, if you want to ask a question of Bob Binkin, just follow us on Twitter at NASA Social or check us out on the web at nasa.gov forward slash social. Thanks for ask, or answering those questions, Bob. Great job. Let's send it now back out to Kate at SpaceX for an update on the countdown. Kate? Always love hearing those responses from any astronaut, but especially Bob because he flew uh, on our uh, DM2 mission uh, a couple years ago. Um, so at this point in time, we're now under an hour. We're at T-minus 48 minutes, and the SpaceX launch team uh, is finishing the final review of data from checkouts of Falcon 9 over the last hour. The launch director uh, has verified with the launch weather officer that weather meets propellant loading constraints. So next up will be to pull the team for readiness, uh, both for propellant load and for launch. This will be the last pull before liftoff. The seven SpaceX responsible engineers, often called REs, indicate that they are go by electronically voting on the online countdown procedure. The launch director, or LD, as you hear it called on the nets, also checks with the Dragon mission director, or MD, and the NASA launch manager to make sure that they are also ready. Earlier, you saw the vehicle assembly building called the VAB, the Falcon and Dragon launch team, as well as key NASA launch members are in the launch control center adjacent to the VAB. They have a view straight toward pad 39A through the large windows of firing room four. Now there on screen, you can see the Dragon capsule on the right-hand side. The crew access arm is still in the service position. I've recently heard that the closeout team has departed the tower and they're in the process of departing the blast danger area. Uh, now, with the crew on board Dragon waiting for next instructions, which will be to stow the crew arm for launch, uh, and uh, the crew arm sequence will be armed and initiated. We should get a good view of the access arm as it Pitching swings. Operators on countdown. Pulling is complete. The team has pulled go for crew access arm retract, LES arm, propellant load, and launch. For all operators in MCCX and firing room four, both control rooms will go into lockdown at T minus 45 minutes and will remain in that state until launch skip system is disarmed. All operators are to remain at their console and maintain a sterile cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming of the launch skip system following orbit insertion or propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non-urgent no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD and they will approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, 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 countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence and immediately proceed into launch abort. The T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off, relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fires imminent or occurring per drag and manual escape flight rules. Launch control at this time may proceed with arming the crew arm for movement. Launch control copies, proceeding to arm, crew arm for movement. All right, quick recap there, all really good news. Um, it sounds like the final poll has been conducted and all of the uh, responsible engineers polled go, um, as well as the range they pulled ready for launch and the NASA team, um, for, or la the NASA launch team uh, is also ready for launch. Uh, so everything continuing to look good. Uh, we just heard there that the crew arm, uh, excuse me, the crew access arm will be armed for retraction, meaning it will move away from the Dragon crew capsule. Crew arm retraction started. All right, and there we should get a view of that crew access arm now moving away from Dragon capsule. Again, this will swing out into its launch position. This is the final change to the crew access arm, or excuse me, to the crew tower. Um, of course, the transporter erector will move away from the rocket as it lifts off uh, and just shortly before liftoff. So that, in fact, will be the last major physical change that we see to the pad. Uh, but this crew access arm retraction um, is the final, uh, will be the final state for the access arm for launch.
This retraction should take about a minute to complete. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, the range continues to be go for launch, monitoring the clearance area around the launch pad, as well as air and sea space around the flight corridor. Uh, and of course, uh, here at Kennedy Space Center, as you see on your screen, uh, the conditions are gorgeous. Uh, everything continues to be acceptable for launch. Many things go into consideration, such as ground winds, uh, any rain that might be in the area, as well as potential for lightning, any thick clouds, and of course, as I mentioned before, downrange landing zones. Uh, we have mentioned before that we've been tracking those, but everything continues to look green for launch. Um, at this point in time, everything is looking on time uh, for our liftoff at noon Eastern. We can see that crew access arm continuing to retract. Pretty cool shot there from inside the arm on the right-hand side of your screen as we see Dragon slowly move out of the frame. So with all that being said, the teams are ready. Uh, we will begin the propellant load at T minus 35 minutes. Uh, and we are getting excited here at SpaceX headquarters. The energy is definitely starting to pick up outside of mission control. Uh, but with that, let's hand it off to Daryl to check in back over there at Kennedy Space Center. All right, thank you, Kate. And uh, back here on the lawn and the host desk looking out at uh, what one of my coworkers called a a picnic vibe with the media and NASA social folks all joined here to watch Crew 5 launch in just crew about access 42 minutes. Crew access arm retraction complete. And there you heard confirmation that that crew access arm has fully retracted from the rocket. A gorgeous shot there from our flight operations team here at the Kennedy Space Center, a helicopter encircling the pad right now to give you that view. Great job, fellas. T minus 42 minutes and counting as we zip around Launch Complex 39A. The background, the launch tower for Dragon, and in the foreground, a Starship launch tower under construction. Up next, we're looking at the launch escape system getting ready to arm, and of course, that comes right before we start loading propellant. We're expecting to hear those call outs in just a bit. On a beautiful bluebird day at the Kennedy Space Center. Our crew, Crew 5, is in their seats at the very top of that rocket inside the capsule Endurance, making its second flight. There they are from left to right. Cosmonaut Anna Kikina, Josh Cassida, Nicole Mann, and Koichi Wakata. And, Daryl, they're getting into position to begin their procedure that will have them arming that launch escape system that you mentioned. Uh, they'll be able to hear some uh, clicking of valves and follow along on their display screen as uh, once they've kicked off that procedure, as the, the vehicle kind of catches up and completes that arming sequence. And as you know, uh, once the fueling operations uh, begin, uh, the crew has to be ready to potentially launch uh, somewhere uh, if there was sort of some sort of a problem. And so that launch escape system needs to be in place and armed in preparation for that fueling operation to begin. That system will stay armed throughout the ascent phase until the crew is actually safely in orbit, allowing them a, a safe way to escape from the Falcon 9 rocket should there be any sort of a, a problem with the vehicle. And we're expecting to see the astronauts close their visors and arm the launch escape system that you just talked about, Bob, here in a little over a minute. We'll get the call out from the launch team. You'll also see them uh, ensure that their feet are in the appropriate uh, locked in position, their straps are tight, uh, because again, should that system be required, uh, they might be going for a, a pretty significant dynamic ride. But uh, of course, we don't expect that to happen today, uh, but they'll have that system uh, in place uh, just in case as the appropriate safety measure. Yeah, Bob, that launch escape system powered by Super Draco engines capable of moving Dragon a half a mile in just seven and a half seconds, which is equivalent to a peak velocity of 436 miles per hour. I know you know this system well. You were very much like briefed and very aware of its capabilities. You, you know, want to be able to not only get off the launch pad, but also get off the rocket 
while in flight. So it's got to move fast. Absolutely, Daryl. And for shuttle systems, you know, the crew would really have to do a lot of manual activities to, to steer the vehicle uh, through the uh, appropriate escape or abort uh, scenarios, as we talked about them in those days. Uh, but this system is highly automated, and the crew primarily follows along with its operations. Dragon, you are go for Section 7 of 4.100 to close visors and arm the launch escape system. SpaceX Dragon copies stepping into Section 7. All crew visors are closed. We are arming the launch escape system. SpaceX copies all. That's Commander Nicole Mann reporting back and confirming their visors are closed and they are ready to arm the launch escape system. And you can see the crew members uh, pulling their straps and ensuring that they are, they are buckled in because uh, from a crew perspective, uh, that relaxation period that I talked about earlier is now over. Mm. Yeah, it's all business now. Want to make sure that you're in your seat firm and tight for the operation of fueling. This is also the part of the operation that starts to be a little bit different than training. You know, you really can't uh, uh, capture the this tones. on Countdown 1, launch escape system is verified armed. All right, we got the verification of the armed escape system. So from a training perspective, the sounds and, and things that the crew will hear during the loading operation are just different than they're able to capture from a training perspective. And so now is when it starts to, again, be a little bit different from a crew perspective. There's no simulating that system. You know, there is some acoustics that they tried to capture. Falcon from 9 tanks will be venting for the start of prop load. Expect loud venting. That they tried to capture with the uh, Demo 1 uh, uh, audio, if you will. But uh, as you heard in the, the comm that uh, just came through there, you know, you need to get reminded to expect loud venting during some of the operations. And these are new things from a crew perspective that uh, you've been briefed on, but now you're going to hear them for the first time. Three of the four crew members inside that capsule right now have never flown to space before. They are first-time flyers. The lone exception, Koichi Wakata, who is a veteran with JAXA and is getting ready to embark on his fifth flight to space. And as we wait for the next mark, You know, the crew's experience, uh, whether it's a space shuttle or a Soyuz or the Dragon vehicle or, or Starliner or Artemis, uh, as we move towards that, these experiences are all slightly different. And so uh, I'm excited to hear, you know, Koichi's discussion as he tries to balance and describe uh, all three of them side by side when he gets back from this mission. <laughs> We'd love to hear him talk about uh, the comparisons. There's only a few of, uh, a few astronauts like him, right, that have been able to fly on all three vehicles. Yes, and, and as we go forward here with the uh, Artemis missions coming forward, I'm excited to have folks compare and contrast uh, their Orion experience, their SLS experience with uh, Falcon 9 or our other rockets. That's going to be fun. Just a few seconds now, and we're awaiting the confirmation to the beginning of loading propellant into the Falcon 9 rocket. A beautiful shot there as we encircle the launch pad. Just a few more seconds until that call out. Propellant loading has started. And so it begins, the loading of propellant aboard uh, the Falcon 9 rocket, liquid oxygen, and RP-1. Got your propellant and your oxidizer, which blended together, make quite the combustion, millions of pounds of thrust to get Crew-5 into space. 
Now, there are a lot of details to that operation, Darrell, with the each of the stages. And as you mentioned, the oxidizer and the fuel both needing to be loaded. And so uh, the crew will follow along with that carefully as the uh, loading operation commences. Uh, if there was any reason for them to need to stop that operation, uh, the, the crew would expect that, that propellant loading to kind of be backed out and reversed. And so they'll want to understand the state of that fueling operation going forward, just in case they had to back out of it. And we've got a social question now from at Grant B117, who asks, how long does it take to complete the fueling operations? You know, it's a great question, Daryl, and, and they started it at uh, 35 minutes because that's really prior to liftoff because that's how really how long it takes for the loading operations to kind of get executed. Uh, the, the crew goes through the process, the ground team, of, of loading that propellant, uh, ensuring that they get the proper commodities on board. Uh, the actual sequencing of things might be affected a little bit by the temperature uh, on a given day, but uh, they have that, that process well monitored, and they begin at 35 minutes because uh, that's how long it takes uh, to, to get the rocket all fueled up. Thank you for asking or for answering those questions. And to you out there for asking the questions, keep them coming. Hashtag Ask NASA on our various social platforms. And again, now that fueling for Falcon 9 has started, that means the eight Super Draco engines inside Crew Dragon are ready, if needed, to launch the capsule away from Falcon 9 in an instant, should there be any kind of emergency associated with the rocket or the pad. The NASA and SpaceX teams have trained extensively for exactly that type of contingency. And so now let's go over to Kate Tice at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne for another operations update. Kate. Thanks, Daryl. You can probably tell by the background noise that uh, things are starting to get more exciting now that we're just uh, practically 30 minutes away from launch of Crew 5, certainly counting down the final minutes. Everything's still looking good for Falcon 9 and Dragon. Uh, with that launch escape system now armed, we are heading for an on-time launch uh, just 32 minutes from now. As you saw, uh, Falcon 9 propellant load began right on time at T minus 35 minutes. The first and second stages of Falcon 9 are each loaded with two liquid propellants. One is fuel, which is loaded into a tank at the bottom of each stage, and the other is an oxidizer, and that's loaded into a tank at the top of each stage. The fuel that we use to power the Merlin engines is a refined kerosene referred to as RP-1 or Rocket Propellant 1. Uh, the oxidizer loaded on each stage is a densified liquid oxygen or LOX. Densified means that it's kept much colder than typical for launch vehicles and it takes up less volume and as such this allows for more oxidizer to be loaded into the first and second stages. Now to ignite the fuel and oxidizer in the Merlin rocket engine we use an ignition fluid called TTEP. When TTEP comes into contact with oxygen, it burns, giving off a green colored flame. Once we have that flame going, we add in the kerosene fuel to the Merlin chamber and the engine ramps up to full power. You might actually be able to see that green flash just as the second stage engine ignites following stage separation, uh, which is expected to happen about two minutes and 48 seconds into flight. Right now, we're topping off helium into pressure vessels on both stages. Uh, this is used to pressurize tanks in flight as propellant is pulled out of those tanks by the Merlin turbo pumps. Now, on board the spacecraft, the astronauts are monitoring systems from their crew Stage monitors. Cryo helium loading has started. All right, there we just heard that the cryo helium load has begun. Again, that is going into those uh, pressure vessels that I mentioned earlier. Now, the crew training simulator uh, has included playback of the sounds that uh, were recorded in a previous Dragon capsule uh, during recent flights. So all of the pops and the hisses that the vehicle puts out, um, all the crew has heard those before, though not live. Uh, so they are prepared for all the noises, the extra noises that they're now hearing. Uh, as for the range, continues to report no problems. They are go to support launch. Weather also clearly looking great. I think we're actually seeing even fewer clouds than we were about 20 minutes ago. Uh, we had a less than 10% chance or probability of violation of our weather constraints, also known as a POV. Uh, so that's really good. Uh, that is for um, the launch site conditions. We are also tracking downrange weather conditions as well as uh, launch sites around the world in the unlikely event that Dragon needs to escape. Now, 
As a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch time because we're heading to the International Space Station. So at this point in time, if we hear a hold for any reason, we will have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity, uh, which is tomorrow, just under 24 hours from today's planned launch. Uh, at this point in time, at just under T minus 30 minutes till launch, let's turn it back over to Jesse and Sandra for an overview of what's to come until liftoff. Great, thanks Kate. Always great to hear that we've got good weather and it looks beautiful over there at KSC. For Crew 5, the astronauts' flight to station will take about 29 hours. And as we await T0 in just about 28 minutes from now, the ground operations team is doing a series of system checks to make sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for launch. You're looking at a live view of our teams at the Cape as they prepare for liftoff. And as we wait for the launch clock to hit zero, we want to give you an overview of what the ascent portion of the mission will look like. Now, once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. About 50 seconds into flight, Falcon's nine engines will throttle down to ha help pass through the period of a maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as max Q. At this point in time, the vehicle will be going supersonic. And once we're through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our nine Merlin engines again. From there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that will happen in rapid succession. The first is MECO, or main engine cutoff. And this is where all nine Merlin 1D engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which is, of course, our second event. This is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, and the first stage will make its way back to Earth for landing, while the second stage continues on its journey with the third event, which is SES-1, or second stage engine start number one. And this is where the MVAC engine lights up and propels the second stage, along with our Crew-5 astronauts to orbit. As stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back down to Earth. The first is the entry burn, and that's where three of the nine M1D engines will reignite and shut down. And this helps to slow the stage down in preparation for entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. While the first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its one Merlin engine that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we will wait for confirmation of a good orbital insertion. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn is just a single engine burn, powerful enough to bring the vehicle's speed down rapidly in order to touch down on the drone ship at about nine and a half minutes into the mission. While Falcon 9's first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. About three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. Once Dragon is a short distance away, it will begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. And it is worth noting that these are not the Super Draco engines that would be used during an abort scenario. About 40 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin. It will take roughly four minutes for the nose cone hooks to unlatch and open, exposing its guidance navigation controls that will help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. And lastly, once the nose cone is deployed, the remaining Draco thrusters on the forward bulkhead will be checked. From there, over Stage the next... Stage two, cryo-helium loading has started. From there, over the next 29 hours, Dragon will be in its rendezvous and approach phases, undergoing a number of phasing burns as it makes its way back to station. All that will be coming up soon, but for now, let's check back in with Shaniqua in Mission Control Houston. Shaniqua? Thanks, Sandra. The flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston are laser focused on the onboard systems of the space station, making sure it is ready to receive Dragon vehicle tomorrow. They're also making sure communication links between the station, Dragon, and the ground are working properly. The consensus right now is that everything is proceeding nominally.
Teams here in Mission Control Houston, the teams in Hawthorne, and the astronauts aboard the space station will monitor the autonomous docking of the Dragon spacecraft tomorrow evening. They'll perform a series of leak checks, then work to open the hatches both on the Dragon side and inside the space station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to take place around an hour and a half after docking. And once aboard, the astronauts will be greeted by station commander Samantha Christopher Reddy, and then the whole station will station crew will join in from for welcoming remarks to the new crew members. Now, due to critical science, this welcoming remarks will be about 90 minutes after the crew is on board. Once on board, the crew members will no longer be referred to as Crew 5, but rather as flight engineers of the International Space Station. Here in Mission Control, Flight Director Greg Whitney is on console overseeing the team for launch, and he will be back tomorrow for docking. We'll be on air continuously through Crew 5's arrival, but live coverage of docking is expected tomorrow around 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time. That's it from now from Mission Control Houston. I'll toss it back to the team in Florida. Daryl, how's it looking? Well, it's wonderful out here, Shaniqua. Wish you could be here. We got picnic weather out here at the press site and Launch Complex 39, where we are looking out for the launch of Crew 5 from historic Launch Complex 39A, a beautiful sweeping shot of the lawn where we have our special guests. The media are here. We've got NASA social folks who are out on the lawn. And, of course, me and Bob. <laughs> Bob's riding shotgun here as we take our coverage to the next level at the final 23 minutes of liftoff. Now, from the countdown, rather. Uh, we are just seconds away from the fifth astronaut rotation mission to the International Space Station under NASA's commercial crew program. Commander Nicole Mann, pilot Josh Cassida, and mission specialist Koichi Wakata and Anna Kikina are strapped into their seats inside the Dragon Endurance at the very top of this rocket here. We, can, uh, we are listening in to the communications as they talk live to the Falcon 9 team. The rocket is fueling. The operation is doing well. And the launch escape system is armed. Of course, that means Dragon is prepared to launch itself away from the Falcon 9 rocket in case of an emergency on the pad or after liftoff. So far, operations looking and sounding as expected. And we are counting down to our liftoff at just after noon, 12 p.m. and 57 seconds after the hour Eastern time. There was a one-second adjustment. That's pretty typical as happens. Uh, when we get to this stage of the mission. The mission is the continuation of rotational crew flights to the International Space Station from U.S. soil on private rockets and spacecraft. Of course, this would not have been possible without the success of the NASA SpaceX Demo-2 test flight now two years ago, and of course, the safe delivery and return of crews one, two, three, and eventually here in about a week, crew four. Of course, we're happy to have the pilot from uh, Demo 2, and that's Bob Bink. And appreciate you being here, been giving us some great uh, thoughts and explanations about everything that's been happening. Well, thank you, Daryl. I'm super excited to be here for Crew 5 and get a chance to relive my experience during the uh, Demo 2 mission. And it's been a great one so far. We've watched the crew get into the capsule. We've watched, uh, they worked through a couple of issues early on, but those have been cleared. Uh, a suit leak check and a uh, hatch leak check that uh, had to be double checked. Now we're rolling along and uh, moving towards liftoff. A couple things that are coming up as we count down. We're going to have stage two RP1 load complete. That's in 20 seconds. A few seconds later, we'll get strong back chill. That will begin in order to set the stage for the stage two liquid oxygen load. Of course, propellants load is not an exact science, but once it completes, we'll hear that call out. Stage two RP1 load is complete. And there you heard it. Let's talk a little bit about the crew. If you're just joining us, we have a four-person crew that we call Crew 5, and it's commanded by Nicole Mann, 
She holds a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering and is a Colonel in the Marine Corps. She was an F-A-18 Hornet and Super Hornet test pilot and deployed twice aboard aircraft carriers in support of combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Nicole was selected by NASA in June of 2013 and in the years that followed, led the astronaut corps in the development of hardware for our Artemis program. Today, the crew flag commander will be flying into space for the first time, and once she reaches space, she will be the first Native American woman to stay on station. A historic first for NASA and for her. Absolutely, Daryl. The astronaut corps is a widely diverse, and I'm just proud to see Nicole join that crew on board the International Space Station. With her is pilot Josh Cassida. He grew up in Bear Lake, Minnesota. The physicist and U.S. Navy test pilot flew the P-3C and the P-8A, as well as 23 combat missions. He later became an instructor at the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School, which is a path to NASA for military officers. Cassida is one of more than 100 graduates who have become astronauts, going all the way back to the Mercury program. More recently, he served as capsule communicator in mission control, but today he is the pilot aboard Dragon. It's a seat I know well, and I look forward to seeing Josh support Nicole and the rest of the crew on their way towards the International Space Station. The mission specialist now, Koichi Wakata, he's the veteran, a Japanese astronaut who has a doctorate in aerospace engineering. In 1996, he became the first Japanese mission specialist aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavor for STS-72. Altogether, Koichi flew four space shuttle missions, a Roscosmos Soyuz, and was on a long-duration stay aboard the International Space Station. During his two-decade career as an astronaut, Koichi has spent 11 months in space. Bob, you spent a fair amount of time in space yourself. It's great to have a veteran aboard. It, it absolutely is. And uh, in addition to being a veteran, uh, Koichi just has a wonderful personality that I know is just uh, it's key to kind of success on board the space station. Our second mission specialist is Roscosmos cosmonaut Anna Kikina. She graduated from the Novosibirsk State Academy of Water Transport in 2006. In 2012, Anna officially became a candidate for the position of test cosmonaut. Crew 5 will be Anna's first flight into space, along with two of her other fellow astronauts. Now, each of these four crew members will be part of Expedition 68, once they arrive at the International Space Station. And there you see them there inside Crew Dragon Endurance, the second flight for this Dragon. I want to let you know if you're here locally, you want to step outside and enjoy the launch, you got a small radio, you can pick us up on VHF radio frequency 146.940 on the megahertz scale, and on UHF radio frequency 444.925 megahertz FM mode. You can hear that all within Brevard County, right here on the beautiful Space Coast. And you can see the... Stage two LOX load has started. Just got the call out that the stage two LOX load has started. Putting that liquid propellant into the second stage. Let's check back in with Kate Tice and get an update from Hawthorne. Kate? Thanks, Daryl. We are T-minus 16 minutes away from launch, and everything continues to look great for Falcon 9 and Dragon. Uh, Falcon 9 began prop load at T-minus 35 minutes. Um, the loading of RP-1 fuel on the second stage is complete. Uh, that finished at T minus 20 minutes. Fuel loading continues on the first stage. Uh, it is almost complete. That should be wrapping up here momentarily. Um, densified liquid oxygen loading is underway on both the first and second stages. Those look to be about 80% on the first stage and uh, has only just recently begun on the second stage. So not much there yet. That will, that will wrap up at T minus three minutes and T minus two minutes respectively. Now as for checkouts of thrust vector controllers, uh, what we call TVC wiggles, those are coming up. 
uh, we basically check to make sure that the thrust vector controllers are able to actuate the engines themselves. Um, they, that's, what, that's what helps create gimbal uh, for those engines, and, and gimbaling is actually how Falcon 9 steers itself. Uh, so those are coming up along with throttle valve checkouts on the engines. The Dragon mission director and team are currently reporting no issues, so really good on that front. Communication checkouts are complete. The crew access arm is retracted, as we can see there, and the crew is strapped in and ready to go, as you can see there on the right-hand side of your screen. Everybody continuing to monitor prop load there on their crew monitors. Now, final instructions to the crew come at T minus 10 minutes. At that point, their crew displays will be configured for launch. This setup gives the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding uh, and provides constant updates on vehicle health. At T minus five minutes, we'll hear the call out uh, that will be in terminal count. And at that point, Dragon will transition to internal power. We'll hear continued call outs on the countdown nets as we get closer to liftoff. As for range, they continue to be go, continuing to monitor the launch corridor uh, and everything remains green. As for weather, we're looking at seven mile per hour winds at the launch site. And as I said before, as the countdown continues, we are seeing fewer and fewer clouds. Just an absolutely stunning day there at Kennedy Space Center. Let's check back in with Daryl to see uh, the last couple minutes prior to liftoff. Thanks, Kate, and it really couldn't be more perfect out here weather-wise for a launch. How about that, Bob? It just looks uh, absolutely stunning to look out and see the, the vehicle ready to go, the crew on board strapped in. I'm just super excited for them. And there's a view of the countdown clock and the historic American flag that has been standing there since the space shuttle program. Now you're looking at a pic of uh, Crew-5. Crew-5 flying aboard the Dragon capsule Endurance, and the booster that you see behind them that they're posing with is a brand new one. Actually was damaged in transit from California to Texas, but it was fixed, repaired. Crew did a great job, the SpaceX team, in getting it all ready. And at the time that Falcon 9 launches Dragon to space, the International Space Station will be 260 statute miles over Australia. Crew-5 will then spend the next 21 hours with mission control team that you see there in Houston, standing by, getting ready for the beginning of this mission. They'll spend 21 or 29 hours, rather, chasing down the International Space Station for a rendezvous at 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow evening. One of the longer transits, Bob. It's true. It's a, a little bit longer than usual, um, or average, I would say, as we work towards Crew-5. But as the launch dates shift around, that changes the time that you can actually arrive on Space Station. Uh, they've got plenty of consumables, so uh, it should be fun to have some time in space. And when they arrive tomorrow evening, we'll have live coverage on NASA TV of docking, as well as the Crew-5 welcome ceremony at 8.15 p.m. Eastern Time, 7.15 p.m. Central. And some final thoughts, Bob, as we get ready to watch Crew-5 launch into space. You know, I, my opportunity to sit here and watch Crew-5 go has just been uh, inspiring again to see another vehicle head towards the International Space Station. Again, I'm, I'm excited for them and uh, just hopeful that Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna have just a wonderful mission. I know that they've got a wonderful launch in front of them. Absolutely, and that's what we're rooting for here. And so with T-minus 11 minutes and counting, we're we're going to spin our chairs around and watch the launch, but we're going to let Pat, uh, Kate and the team focus on the pad as we proceed through the final stretch of the countdown. We'll turn it over to Kate Tice at SpaceX headquarters in California to take us through. Take it away, Kate. Thanks, Daryl. As you can probably tell by the background noise, the crowd is definitely growing here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Uh, certainly one of our company traditions is to watch the launch itself from behind Mission Control, which you see there on your screen. Uh, you can see this is Mission Control Hawthorne, or as you sometimes hear referred to as uh, MCCX. And then, of course, a uh, crowd of employees watching from behind. I personally also stand there if I'm not doing the webcast, so I can confirm it's a great spot to watch launch. Um, I, like I said, as you can see, the, the energy is certainly starting to grow now that we're about to hit T minus 10 minutes. Beautiful view there of Falcon 9 and Dragon on the pad, ready to take Crew 5 to space. 
We did discuss Dragon, the... SpaceX, confirm crew displays are configured for launch. Loco, we would like to give a huge thanks to the NASA and SpaceX team, the thousands of people for their development, preparation, and training in getting Endurance and Crew 5 to the launch pad today, and your continued support in helping to make this a successful mission. We look forward to joining the rest of our Expedition 68 crew members aboard the International Space Station. And a special thanks on behalf of all the crew to our family and friends. It is your love and support that help make dreams come true. Now let's do this. Crew 5 displays are configured for launch. Copy, and Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna, on behalf of the entire team at SpaceX, good luck, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. And those words from Nicole Mann, the first female commander of a Dragon, as she thanked the many folks that have helped get them to this point. We're now less than nine minutes away from launch today. Upon liftoff, you'll hear a number and letter combinations, which mark different abort zones throughout the flight, as well as some performance calls. The first two are 1A and 1B, and those signify the first stage and will last up to the very north tip of North Carolina. The next are 2A through 2E, and those will come into play once the second stage kicks in, lasting from the top of North Carolina all the way to the tip of Newfoundland in the Northern Atlantic. You'll also hear a spot that is to be avoided, and you might hear Shannon or a forward to Shannon, and that actually refers to Shannon, Ireland, meaning they would target off the east coast of Ireland if they were later in that second stage and did need to abort for some reason. So the next major milestone that we're looking towards will come just seconds from now, and that will be when engine chill begins on the first stage of the engine. That's right. So engine chill is basically when we take a little bit of that super chilled, densified liquid oxygen, and we flow it through the turbo pumps of the Merlin M1D engines on the first stage. This helps to prepare the turbo pumps and avoid any thermal shock to the hardware when they see the full flow of liquid oxygen during ignition. Uh, we're also expecting the uh, conclusion of uh, prop load um, for the RP-1 on first stage to wrap up at T minus six minutes. LOX load continues to be underway on both first and second stages. Again, wrapping those uh, at T minus three minutes and two minutes. And after that, we'll hear a number of callouts related to Dragon's flight computer. Some will stage be the- Stage one engine chill has started. And you did just hear that call out that stage one engine chill has begun. Coming up in just about 45 seconds, we should expect to hear that RP-1 load is complete. RP-1 load is that densified kerosene or rocket fuel that will help propel the crew into orbit. All of that RP-1 is loaded into the first stage and we are standing by to hear that it was uh, loaded into the second stage as well. Again, we expect that to wrap at T minus six minutes. Uh, the venting that you see on screen is totally normal. That is just some Stage of- Stage one, RP-1 load is complete. Great news there, that RP-1 load is now finished. Um, as I was saying, the venting that you see on the vehicle is totally normal. That's just some of the super chilled, densified liquid oxygen, uh, uh, just vaporizing as it comes into contact and vents from the vehicle. And coming up, we'll also hear the call for Dragon to configure for terminal count, and then it will be transferred over to internal power. And then we'll hear that propellant tanks on Falcon 9 are getting ready to pressurize, which helps add some additional rigidity and structural support as we get ready for a strong back retract. That strong back will retract a couple of degrees at first, and then we will see it swing open completely uh, just shortly or at the moment of liftoff. Falcon 9 tanks will be pressurizing for strong back retract. Right, and there's that indication that we are preparing for that strong back retraction. Coming up in just a few seconds, we should hear that Dragon is in terminal count. 
Dragon is in configure for terminal count. All right, there we heard that call. Dragon onboard computers have now taken control of the vehicle. As I mentioned before, first stage locks or liquid oxygen loading is underway and will wrap up at T minus three minutes. Second stage will wrap its locks load at T minus two minutes. Launch teams continue to report no issues and everything remains green and for an on-time launch. Has started. And here in just a couple seconds, you might be able to see the strong back arm as it does begin to retract. As Kate said, it will recline two degrees. We can just barely make out the, the, clamp, the clamp arms are now beginning to move. All right, now that those clamp arms are removed, as Sandra said, this will retract by two degrees. Uh, and then at liftoff, the strong back will retract another to 45 degrees, uh, allowing Falcon 9 to clear. Strong back is part of the transporter erector, and the transporter erector is what provides uh, the liquids, and the gases, and the electrical connections to the vehicle. It's also what we use to integrate the vehicle in its horizontal position, and we can see that two degree retraction just now. And the next call out that we should hear in about 20 seconds is that the first stage locks load is complete. Stage one, locks load is complete. And there we go, all of the oxidizer loaded on stage one. Soon we'll hear that stage two locks load is complete and that will be the last propellant call out we'll hear today. Now less than three minutes until launch. Dragon is in terminal count and is on internal power. All right, there we heard the good news that Dragon is now on internal power. Again, the white clouds that you see there at the base of the Dragon trunk, totally normal. That's just the vapor uh, from the liquid oxygen. Again, second stage now wrapping up its locks load. Excuse me, first stage wrapping up its locks load um, just a few minutes ago, and now moving toward wrap up of second stage locks load, which will complete at T minus two minutes. Coming up on two minutes until liftoff, standing by for word that stage two locks load has been completed. Dragon is in auto idle. Stage two locks load is complete. There we heard the call out. Falcon 9 is now completely fueled. Wow. All of its propellants. So yeah, our starting. All of its propellants, and we can see that leftover liquid oxygen uh, now being vented or released, uh, now flowing further away from the vehicle. So nearly 1 million pounds of liquid oxygen in RP1 now on board Falcon 9. It is fully loaded and ready for launch. And coming up at T minus one minute, we'll hear that Dragon is in countdown. Its flight computer will switch to countdown mode and we'll hear that the flight termination system on Falcon 9 is FTS armed. FTS is armed, Falcon 9 is in startup and is now controlling. And there you heard it, Dragon's, Dragon is in countdown. Dragon's flight computer in countdown. The flight termination system now armed. We should get the final go for launch from SpaceX launch director, Mark Sergis. Godspeed, go for launch. SpaceX Dragon, go for launch. SpaceX reports go, seconds. crew reports go, 30 seconds until liftoff. T minus 15.
35 seconds into the fifth rotational crew mission on board Dragon and Falcon 9. Coming up in just a few seconds, we'll hear the call out for Stage 1 throttle down. Stage 1 throttle down. Falcon 9 engines throttling down to help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. This period is known as max Q, and once the vehicle... There, we just heard that the vehicle is now traveling faster than the speed of sound. Once through max Q, we'll throttle those Merlin engines back up. Max Q. Stage one throttle up. Stage one throttle up. Stage one Bravo. Copy, one Bravo. That call out for one Bravo means we're in the second and final abort mode for the first stage, continuing to get good performance. The crew is already pulling over two Gs. And next up is going to be a couple of events in rapid succession. First will be engine chill on the second stage and back engine. And there you heard that call out. And then we'll have Miko or main engine cutoff where the nine engines igniting will cut off in preparation for second stage separation. Then we'll see the single Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage ignite and continue to carry the crew five astronauts to orbit. Just like we did on first stage, that MVAC chill is intended to help pre-chill the hardware prior to the full flow of that densified liquid oxygen. Stage one throttle down. At this point in time, those nine Merlin engines are beginning to throttle down in preparation for MECO or main engine cutoff. Standing by for MECO. And MECO. Stage two alpha. And Stage separation confirmed. Copy two alpha. There we should see that second engine begin to ignite now. And obviously confirmed by the loud cheer behind us here at Mission Control Hot Board. And we're also in two alpha for the aborts if needed. Again, second stage is lit and continuing to carry the crew five astronauts into orbit. We're now getting a view of the first stage uh, after that stage separation. The second stage is still being illuminated by that single Merlin vacuum engine, and that's on the right-hand side of your screen. First stage on the left-hand side of your screen, making its way back to Earth. We will be attempting to land it on our drone ship, um, which today we are using just read the instructions. Acquisition signal, Bermuda. And we did hear that acquisition of the ground station in Bermuda. The first stage is continuing to make its way back to Earth. And the second stage is going Dragon, to continue. Apex, trajectory nominal. Another good call. Trajectory nominal. Drop and copy. Confirmation there from Commander Nicole Mann. You can also sort of see the, the Space Coast there in the background of the first stage on the left-hand side of your screen. It also looks like you can actually see the thrust plume uh, created by the first stage as it's now rotating just out of screen. Second stage is going to continue firing until a little over eight minutes into the flight, really doing the heavy lifting now, getting the crew into orbit. Everything continues to look nominal on both first and second stages. As I mentioned before, the first stage will be making uh, a, a landing on one of our drone ships, which is currently parked a couple hundred miles off the coast of Florida in the Atlantic Ocean. So we can see now that... Dragon, SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Good confirmation there that we have good trajectory. The second stage now traveling over 5,400 miles per hour. Crew is pulling a little more than 1G right now. That's going to continue to ramp up, peaking just before we get to second stage cutoff here in just a few minutes from now.
first stage we'll be performing two separate burns, a re-entry burn where we reignite three of the Merlin back, or excuse me, the Merlin M1D engines on the first stage. Uh, we ignite the center engine into radial, radial engines to help slow it down as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. And then the second final burn, and that will be the landing burn on our drone ship. And the single M back engine Great. that you see. The single M back engine that you see on the right of your screen is continuing to fire. We did hear another call out that trajectory is nominal. Crew heading in the direction that they are supposed to be. This single engine can produce over 220,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space. Now over 200 kilometers in altitude. We will start to hit events now in a rapid succession as the first stage continues to make its way back to Earth and the second stage continues its burn. Just a couple minutes left in that burn. For those of you just joining us, just over six and a half minutes ago, uh, our four Crew-5 astronauts launched from Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and they are now making their way into orbit on the second stage inside Dragon. Crew Dragon. Which we're hearing that the trajectory on that is nominal. Uh, Dragon copy. They are in, safe inside uh, Dragon Endurance, whereas the first stage on the left-hand side of your screen uh, is making its way back to Earth. We are coming up to the re-entry burn, which as I said before, we ignite three of the nine Merlin engines to help slow the booster down as it re-enters the dense part of the Earth's atmosphere. As the entry burn completes, we'll be in the Stage final... Stage one, entry burn startup. So there we heard Stage the call two, out. The you can there see it on your screen that that entry burn has been initiated. And as that entry burn completes, we'll be in the final um, different abort phases here shortly, which essentially correspond to areas along the very northeastern seaboard of the U.S. Stage and then, one entry burn shut down. Great news, that entry burn was shut down. And then those last all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, Atlantic off the coast of Scotland for those abort zones. Everything continues to look nominal for both the first and second stage stages. And the crew with the second stage still attached is now traveling over 13,000 miles per hour. We're about 10 seconds away from Seco 1. Copy, Shannon. Shannon, stage that call one, out. Transonic. That call out for Shannon, Ireland, indicative of our final abort zone. After this, we'll see second stage shut off, and we'll be listening for confirmation of a good orbit, which tells us the crew and Dragon are exactly where and they need to be. And there we had confirmation that the MVAC has shut down simultaneously. Uh, the entry... Dragon, SpaceX, and you heard that call for a good insertion. We will coast for a few minutes. There we can see the drone ship coming into view as Falcon 9 Launch attempts. The stage one landing leg deploy. You can see those landing legs have now deployed. And as you can see on your screen, and you can hear by the clapping and cheering behind me, Falcon 9, has landed on our drone ship, just with the instructions, parked off the coast of Florida. And again, that second stage separation will be coming up just a couple of minutes now. We do coast for a few minutes after second engine cutoff to allow any rates to, or motion to dampen out and settle. And looks like we're gonna get a view of the second stage as it separates here shortly. We did hear that the crew has been successfully inserted into a good orbit.
Again, the crew is still attached to the second stage. We are expecting stage separation to occur in just over a minute from now, about one minute and eight seconds. And that's when the, uh, excuse me, when the second stage will separate from the dragon trunk. The dragon trunk is the part of hardware where we are able to house the uh, cargo that is able to be exposed to the vacuum of space as well as the solar panels, which help power Dragon while it is on orbit. Again, that stage separation is now coming up in about 30 seconds. After stage separation, we will have nose cone deployment. Now that Dragon is in the vacuum of space, we're able to, we will be able to open the nose cone and expose that forward hatch, which is what is utilized to dock uh, autonomously with the International Space Station. And that nose cone does stay closed for the flight uphill to help protect all of the guidance, navigation, and control sensors. We are standing by for second stage separation. And there is separation. Dragon separation confirmed. words there from the Crew 5 crew, as well as... And Dragon South 9C, thanks for the words. Uh, had a great ride. Have a good mission. We'll see you later. A wonderful Mean Girls reference there by Launch Director uh, Mark Soltis, and then we just heard from Chief Engineer Dan Alex. And we just heard our first Quindar tone, indicating the crew is Double in space. Humidifier activation and service section Draco checkups. Effective loss of signal, New Hampshire. Dragon copy. And Kate, it did look like we were getting our first views of that microgravity indicator. I did see that as well. <laughs> and we're getting views now of the crew on orbit, three of them for the first time ever. We saw some cheers, some high fives. Looks like they're feeling great.
Hopefully we can see that zero G indicator float back into view and hopefully get a better shot of it. I couldn't quite tell what it was, although it kind of looked like it may have been an Einstein doll. Uh, but that's just kind of what it looked like from the, the backside. I think you're right, Kate. It looked like a baby Einstein to me. <laughs> So the next milestone that we're looking ahead towards is the nose cone opening. If you've just joined us, joined us, we had a successful liftoff uh, exactly 16 minutes ago of the Crew 5 mission. Uh, they had an on-time liftoff from Kennedy Space Center at noon Eastern time. They had a smooth ride up to orbit. The first stage landed successfully on our drone ship. Uh, just read the instructions and everything has been looking good so far. Uh, we are hoping to get another view on board Dragon uh, once we're able to get that camera back. Uh, but so far, uh, you know, everything leading up to this point in time, we got a shot there of the uh, MVAC engine, which is no longer firing. It is uh, coasting um, with that sec attached to the second stage, which has been separated from Dragon. Um, yeah, so everything was super smooth this morning, uh, starting all the way back uh, I think we got here around T minus four hours and uh, super smooth countdown. A beautiful day from Kennedy Space Center. It looked like a, a gorgeous view uh, from where Daryl and Bob were sitting. Uh, but yeah, we are uh, standing by for the nose cone opening. Now that the Dragon spacecraft is in space, we are able to. Get loss of signal. Keep it lit. We are able to open up that uh, nose cone and expose the forward hatch, which is what is utilized to autonomously uh, dock with the International Space Station, but of course to protect that hardware that as well. As well as uh, protect the uh, guidance and navigation control hardware. Uh, we keep that nose cone closed during uh, launch preparations and during the ascent portion. So, uh, as you can see, saw there uh, momentarily, uh, Dragon is in space, and uh, the crew four, or excuse me, the crew five astronauts, all four of them are um, floating, uh, or they will be able to float soon. Uh, we're hoping to get another view of that zero G indicator once we're able to bring cabin. Uh, onboard cabin views uh, back to you of the Crew 5 crew. Uh, we always like to see what the uh what the zero G gravity indicator is, as you saw earlier in the web webcast, uh, Bob actually brought uh, the zero G indicator that he and Doug used on the Demo 2 mission, uh, a lovely sequin dinosaur, which I also have one at my desk. Not the, uh, Bob obviously has the one that went to space. Mine is a replica, uh, but we love seeing these zero-G indicators. It's a really nice way to connect uh, those of us on ground with the folks up in space. So as I said before, we are anticipating uh, nose cone deployment shortly. Uh, just you can do a quick check-in, and oh, there we can see now uh, the nose cone, the hooks have been released, and we see that nose cone moving with a pretty up-close shot. We're continuing to see that nose cone open. and Acquisition of signal, fine. As we've mentioned, this does uncover a number of critical systems for the flight up to the space station that will be required for docking. There are six hooks that hold the nose cone in place during the launch and ascent portions. Those have begun to retract and the nose cone is beginning to swing open. The nose cone is about two-thirds of the way open at this time, so we do expect it to be fully open here shortly. Shortly after nose cone deployment, the crew will be able to get their visors open and they'll be given the okay to get out of their suits and that will allow them to settle in for their ride to the International Space Station. It is about a 29-hour journey for the crew from launch to docking to the space station, but as you said, they'll be able to get out of their suits, get comfortable, get some rest, and just enjoy being in the microgravity environment of space. Again, we have three first-time flyers and one veteran on today's flight. 
but I'm sure it was an exciting moment. No matter how many times you've been to space, I can't imagine that it ever gets old. I would probably agree with that. Um, I would also imagine that the three first-time space goers will have a brief period of acclimation to gravity. I know I certainly would, and I also recognize that my period probably wouldn't be very brief in order to get acclimated to that lack of gravity. Um, but yeah, this is something that um, the veteran um, astronauts on board station uh, are you know, always happy to help uh, really introduce the, the new space goers uh, to the new environment. Absolutely. And we did also hear that there was good service section Draco checkouts that took place. We are standing by for that nose cone to be fully deployed, but it should be coming here momentarily. Dragon, we see a nominal nose cone opening, TCS and forward bulkhead Draco checkouts. Dragon copies. Next burn is a the upcoming phase burn per your displays. We see the phase burn in 28 minutes. Good read back. So you heard it there, the nose cone has fully been opened successfully. We had some good checkouts on the Draco thrusters, on the service section Draco thrusters rather. And we also had nominal forward bulkhead checkouts. That's right, and the astronauts should be getting the okay to doff or remove their suits uh, in about six or seven minutes. Uh, I would imagine that, um, as Sandra mentioned before, we do have three space newbies on board today. I would imagine that they would be pretty excited to get out of their seats. They've been in, uh, in these seats for a while. Uh, the crew ingressed hours ago, and uh, if I would imagine that the three folks and, uh, and even the veteran, everybody would be excited to get out and uh, be able to float around a little bit for the first time on this Crew 5 mission. Yes, absolutely. And you do see the crew working through some procedures there on the touch pads that they do have in front of them. They'll continue to have those available for them throughout their flight uphill. Again, this is going to be about a 29 hour launch to docking for Crew 5. It seems as though that zero G indicator may have floated out of view perhaps up above the crew displays. We can see that the visors are up. Dragon, SpaceX, environments are looking good for suit doffing. For today, we can leave the uh, camera configured for a little while longer, but at this time, you are go for 4.012 and 4.300. As a reminder, please stow the suits with the visors closed. I'll copy. Okay, Dragon copies. We are go for 4.012 and 4.300. We're going to keep the cameras configured, and when we stow the suits, we'll do it with the visors. Good read back. At this time, you're also go to tell the world a little bit about that stowaway we saw shortly after second engine cutoff. So we're standing by from a few words, so standing by for a few words from the crew about that zero G indicator. And there it is. Dragon, 
And no worries, repeating my last one there, I was going to uh, have you all talk a little bit about your zero-G indicator, uh, but we can hold that off for the next uh, ground station pass here for Dubai. Uh, at this time, what I'll do is I'll take the cameras external for suit doffing, and then uh, you let me know when we're allowed to come back on board. Okay, Dragon copy, so we'll let you know when you come back on with the cameras, and we're excited to talk about our uh, show right here. Okay, here. Dragon copy, and work. And it does sound like we are in a brief expected loss of signal with the crew. This does happen from time to time when we're in between our satellites, but we will have views and communication back with them here shortly. And we're looking forward to hearing their words on their stowaway and what that special meaning is for the crew. So with Crew 5 now successfully on orbit, let's head over to our counterparts at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Daryl it was spectacular to watch this launch from here in Hawthorne but tell me what was it like to see it on the ground <laughs> it was amazing first of all we got an idyllic day right here uh, on the Space Coast I mean the temperatures are like uh, you know mid 70s there's a cool breeze phenomenal launch Bob I want to get your thoughts you've flown you've watched this was pretty perfect. No, this was just outstanding. It was picturesque, you know, with the blue sky, the blue background, uh, a beautiful day here in Florida. The only thing I, I, I wish was that I was there with them because that is the one place that is better to watch a launch from uh, than right here at the Kennedy Space Center is on board the rocket ship. I got to believe that. And uh, though we weren't on board, we did get to watch the views as we were going up and saw them land the booster, which, by the way, that booster also going to be SpaceX's and NASA's crew six booster so more the reuse nasa taking advantage of that as well absolutely every chance that we get to reuse a a capsule or reuse a booster kind of drives down cost and uh increases the opportunity for more folks to fly in space now i'm headed out uh, to take a swim right i mean this <laughs> is just perfect out here bob thank you for your thoughts um and now we're going to move on we've got an interview here with uh Robin Gatens, the director of the International Space Station, who also joins us here. And you got to experience the launch from right here uh, outside the, the press site. And I want to ask you, how did you enjoy it? Well, it's always exciting to see launch to the International Space Station. I've seen many, but uh, especially uh, to see an, a new international crew uh, headed to the International Space Station was, was very exciting. And of course, you, you nailed it. Beautiful day. Really glad we we got this one off today. Absolutely, and they'll make that 29-hour transit to the space station. Uh, you're the director of the International Space Station, so I want to ask you, I, I heard there's a book coming out uh, that's, uh, I, there have been books before about the International Space Station, but a new one's coming out. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, it's called Our Benefits to Humanity. Uh, it is a publication we have put out before, and we actually released it in July, so it's out. Uh, it's both in print format, as well as online, so uh, people can just search on Benefits to, for Humanity, International Space Station, and find that book. And it highlights uh, all of the wonderful research that's going on on the space station. This crew will be doing over 200 experiments during their time on the International Space Station, ranging from uh, medical uh, kinds of research that, that will help treat diseases and, and produce uh, new, new drugs uh, here on Earth, regenerative medicine. One day we might even uh, print uh, organs uh, for transplant on Earth. We have Earth science going on on Space Station, a number of climate instruments to help us um, understand Earth's climate. Uh, really exciting results. This is truly uh, what we call the decade of results on the International Space Station, where uh, we're, we're, we're building on past uh, lessons and capabilities to just uh, compound the results that we're able to get out of the space station. And 235 investigations, 76 new ones, and you mentioned the decade, two decades, more than two decades, the yes. International Space Station has been operating. You mentioned some of the science that they're going to be doing. I'm wondering if you have a favorite that you've kind of identified, like, oh, I can't wait to find out the results of that. Well, I've been tracking a lot of them. Um, I'm really excited about some of the medical uh, things. Uh, we're flying again a, uh, 
a payload by a company called Lambda Vision, and they're producing uh, retinal implants that could be used to uh, help uh, patients with um, ocular degeneration. Uh, so that's really exciting. I'm excited about uh, what we're learning. Um, you know, with respect to the climate, we got brand new climate instruments up on board. Um, we've got companies learning how to make better products through their research on uh, through the ISS uh, National Lab um, and their their work on the space station. So um, I'm also excited about plant research going on on mm -hmm. space station. I think that's not only important for future exploration missions but also to help us grow plants in harsh environments, small spaces here on Earth. And also NASA, while doing all of that, is continuing to work towards its ultimate goal of uh, getting to the moon, going back to the moon and sustaining our presence there. A lot of technology uh, at the station that works towards that end. We want to actually pause, though, for one second because we understand that one of the astronauts, uh, Josh Cassida, has a statement that he is going to uh, make. Uh, it, uh, it is relatively about uh, his zero-G indicator, which if you saw in the coverage, it was a, I don't know if it was a baby Einstein, Bob, but it was a little Einstein. It definitely <laughs> looked like a small Einstein, but we'll listen to Josh and hear exactly the details. Let's listen in. Again, waiting for astronaut Josh Cassida with a special message. And Dragon, cameras are internal. Space next Dragon copies, we are internal with the waistbands off and stand by for the cabin mic check. You see Koichi Wakata is out of his seat. Yeah, this is Fabix Dragon from the cabin mic com check. And Koichi, I've got you five by five. How me? Mike, we have you loud and clear also. Great news, and we're also getting some great views inside the capsule here. So if you all want to get a chance to talk about your indicator, we'd all love to hear some. Absolutely, Mike. So, uh, a couple years after we come up with his groundbreaking theory of special relativity, Albert Einstein, in his mind, still had a couple loose ends to tie up. While he was sitting in the patent office, because he wasn't famous yet, definitely should have been, he had what his happiest thought of his entire life. That thought was, a person in free fall doesn't feel their own weight. That thought, along with some others that he built upon, led to general relativity and our understanding of gravitation and curvature of space-time experiencing Einstein's happiest thought continuously, like the International Space Station has been doing for over 20 years. On Crew 5, call this little guy our free fall indicator. We're here to tell you there's plenty of gravity up here. In fact, that's what's keeping us in orbit right now and preventing this trip on a Crew Dragon from being a one-way trip. A little bit like life. We live in the same world, we live in the same universe. Sometimes we experience it in a very different way from our neighbors. We can all keep that in mind. Hopefully we can all continue to do an absolutely amazing thing. Do it together. Well, that was excellent, Josh. We appreciate you all taking the chance to share with us some of those special words and some of the meaning to you all. I'll tell you, my crewmates are just happy that uh, we didn't break out a dry erase board and get into more detail. <laughs> 
We'll chat lensing later. Absolutely. A message from okay, at this time. astronaut Josh Cassida, the pilot of Crew-5, and his fellow astronauts and cosmonaut floating in space high above the Earth as they head to the International Space Station with a special message about Albert Einstein, who is represented there floating around space as the zero-G indicator, but then also a nod to his uh, theory of relativity. E equals MC squared, I believe, Bob. <laughs> well, there are a lot of great things that Einstein was responsible for, and uh, I would just say that uh, maybe there are five folks uh, experiencing his uh, happiest thought on board uh, the Dragon capsule just right now. Absolutely, and NASA is looking to return humans to the surface of the moon, and this is part of it, going to the International Space Station. We mentioned some of the efforts in, uh, in going up there, and of course the science that's going to be done by Crew-5. We're looking forward to that as well. Some final thoughts, uh, Bob, about the day today. Well, it was just a wonderful day, a chance for me to relive the launch experience with the Falcon 9 and the Dragon capsule, and I'm just super excited for the, uh, the Crew-5 uh, and little Einstein uh, on board and in free fall right now. A very special moment indeed. Before we wrap up, I want to send it over to Megan Cruz, who is with Deputy Administrator and former Space Shuttle astronaut Pam Melroy. I am Pam, and I have just been chatting about how wonderful of a day this was for a launch. Oh, it, it's a gorgeous day yes. here at the historic Kennedy Space Center. For me to see the next generation of launch vehicles launching to the space station was thrilling. And also the next generation of, of young explorers. You know, you and I were talking about a young boy here, guys, that bought a, a, a space <laughs> suit, an astronaut suit from downstairs at our, our, uh, our store and was wearing it around and running around. How cute was that to see him so excited? Well, I found it pretty cute to see the three rookies who were on the flight, as well as my <laughs> very dear personal friend, Koichi Wakata, who I flew with in 2000 to the wow. space station. So I'm inspired by both the young and the experienced. And speak to me about that, That, like you said, you, you've flown on the space shuttle three times. Talk to me about that ascent, how it must feel as they're going up through the atmosphere. It's absolutely a remarkable experience. And I found myself thinking as I was looking at the, the schedule for this uh, rocket, how physics drives so much of what we do. So it's very similar in the timing of everything, uh, but uh, the space shuttle was a little bit of a wild ride, I have to say. It had a lot of vibration, particularly the first two minutes. Um, but, you know, it's a very different experience when you're here on the ground. Uh, it always brings tears to my eyes. I pray for the crew. When you're inside the vehicle, you're having a blast. <laughs> so I'm glad to hear that they were having a blast. Uh, talk to me about why these commercial crew missions are so important. Well, they're really important to us for a lot of different reasons. Uh, the whole value that NASA brings uh, to the American people and, in fact, to humanity is around science, uh, uh, a strong science and technology posture for the country, and inspiration. And uh, we see that all wrapped up in commercial crew because we see the ability to do more science on orbit yes. because we can carry more crew members. We see the advancements that have been made through NASA investments in commercial crew and commercial cargo that are lifting our entire space industry. And of course, there's nothing better than seeing an astronaut fly to space for inspiration. Sure. And what's next for NASA? You know, right behind us, we have the vehicle assembly building. Inside is NASA's Artemis One rocket. Are you excited for that? Oh, I'm, I'm very excited. I'll tell you, it's a big deal when a new rocket flies for the first time. And uh, we have learned a lot. We, we have a lot to learn, just like I was a test pilot. So when we flew airplanes, uh, we never actually launched the first try. Usually we just taxied down the runway. <laughs> so we've, we've taken her out to the runway a couple of times now, and we've learned a lot. And I cannot wait to see the most powerful rocket in the world launch going to the moon. Yeah, we're doing a lot of great stuff here, and we're so happy to bring viewers on the ride with us, right? You bet. That's <laughs> the whole idea. NASA shares and inspires. Perfect. Pam, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Guys, we're going to send it back to you for the last time today. Thank you very much, Megan. Great job out there. Appreciate it. And Nicole, Josh, and Koichi, and Anna are now on course to arrive at the International Space Station around 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. And, of course, NASA TV will stay on the air for continuous live coverage along Crew-5's entire ride to station. Meanwhile, SpaceX's YouTube channel will join live coverage starting at roughly two hours prior to docking. And though our coverage here at Kennedy 
is coming to a close. We will turn it over to the team in Houston to take us through the next phases of the Crew-5 mission all the way through the arrival at the International Space Station. For those of you watching online on NASA's YouTube, make sure you take a look at the description below. You'll see the video link there, and you'll find that for Crew-5 Coast Phase. Live coverage will continue at that link shortly. You can see it at the bottom of your screen. Pull that up for you. If you're watching on NASA TV, you won't notice a thing, and coverage will continue. So a post-launch news conference is scheduled for 1.30 p.m. Eastern time on NASA TV. And you can find mission updates on Twitter, at NASA, at SpaceX, and on the web at nasa.gov, including timing on any potential live tours of Dragon uh, Endurance during the trip to station. Now, before we sign off from Kennedy, I want to thank my partner and co-host, Bob Bankin, for being on the launch broadcast, sharing your incredible insight and experiences. Bob, I really enjoyed listening to you today. Thank you so much to you and to Megan, your wife, who helped us with Crew 4. Uh, we look forward uh, to hearing more from uh, your family, as well as uh, maybe seeing Theo on a, on a future <laughs> launch broadcast. Well, well thank you, Daryl. I, I very much appreciate that. And, of course, thank you to my wife and uh, my son and our dog, Shadow, for joining us uh, for a short period of time during the during today's broadcast. And, uh, again, I just want to echo uh, Deputy Administrator Pam Mulroy's words with, uh, it's been an exciting year. Uh, the Crew 5 folks are, are just getting started on their excitement for the year, if you will, on their way to the space station right now. But we've got an Artemis uh, 1 rocket over there, the SLS in the Vehicle Assembly Building. Looking forward to seeing that back out on the pad and uh, getting her launched later this year. Coming to a launch pad soon, mid-November, we all hope, and uh, we're looking forward to that as well immensely. Huge thanks to all of our guests for joining us today, and thank you to all of you for watching. Here now are the highlights from the journey we took today, and just a reminder from here at the Kennedy Space Center to keep looking up. They're getting suited up inside that historic suit-up room, everything going smoothly. And there they are. The astronauts of Crew-5 taking their first steps outside. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Vehicle is pitching down range. Stay